thank you so much for uh, taking the time out to attend this webinar. We're really excited, obviously, for this webinar to hear from uh, Dan here, who's obviously the CEO and co-founder of Black Ops. Myself, my, my name is Robin Holt here. I'm representing Virtual. Uh, and yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with Dan and the Black Ops team to prepare for uh, exciting events like this and the launch of the upcoming offer tomorrow. So just to explain to everybody the format for this webinar today, um, we're going through a really quick presentation just to really cover some high level details. Some, there's some really exciting stuff in there, uh, which Dan is going to run you through. We will be taking questions and answers at the end, but I would really like to encourage everybody to use the Q&A feature because, of course, when we start to use that chat function, we lose a lot of those questions further up they go and it's not as easy to monitor and moderate them. So please do ask questions. Feel free to add them throughout the webinar. We'll be more than happy to, uh, to take them after the presentation. But Dan, I'm quickly going to throw it to you to uh, introduce yourself. I'm sure a lot of people know your familiar face, but uh, over to you. Awesome. Uh, yes, well, I'm Dan, co-founder uh, and CEO of Black Ops Brewery. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. First of all, I do have a beer here. so. I'm going to crack that. It'd be stupid to do this without having a beer. I've got East Coast Haze, which was 19th in the hottest 100 on Saturday. With no sort of marketing push on our part behind it. So we were very, very stoked with that. Um, I'm not bitter at all that I haven't been able to try it yet being in Victoria. So was that a pun? Uh, clearly. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, I'll do the content. You do the jokes. This is good. Um, Perfect. All right. Oh, I've, I've just had a look at through all the attendees. It's really cool. There's a lot of familiar faces on here. We've got a mix of staff, of people that I recognize staff, existing investors, some new ones, and obviously um, some new people as well that I don't recognize. So welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I'll try and do this reasonably quickly because I know if I talk for too long, it's going to be pretty boring, isn't it? Um, can you just confirm you can see that? Okay. Is that the whole, the whole thing? That looks, you can see? that looks perfect, Dan. Awesome. All right. And I can't see any of the chat while this is happening. So you'll have to monitor it and see if anyone's abusing me or anything in there. That's what I'm on top of. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's kick it off with this quote from our original number one investor. You can invest in houses, you can invest in stocks, but you can't drink those, which I think is really fun. Not very businessy, but still cool. Thanks, Simpo. He's probably on this call. He just texted me two minutes ago. Um, so this is what I'm going to go through. Um, I want to go through a little bit of the results since our last round of equity crowdfunding, which was the first round ever to close by a brewery in Australia, was at the start of 2019. And our business has changed a hell of a lot since that. If you've been following us, which I know a lot of you have, you, you will know that already, but I've got some specifics to go through. I've got some specifics around the raise. Um, all the detail will be in the offer doc that comes out tomorrow, but I've got a few details here tonight for you. Um, I've also got a couple of charts in here from things that we don't tend to publish, just things that we talk about internally, which might interest some of you. Um, a quick update on our expansion, which is our main reason for doing the raise. We're expanding pretty rapidly. And at the moment, we're right in the middle of building a big canning line. Um, we actually just started cutting the drains today. We got the final containers on Friday night, just, the, just before the hottest 100. Um, so that's all happening right now. Um, and a few little things for, for 2022 plans and, and Q and A at the end. At the end, I, do, I have been asked a lot of questions on email. I think I've probably got about two, 300 emails over the last week and I've replied to all of them. So if, if I haven't replied to you, then something's happened. Feel free to send another one or something, but I have replied to every, everyone that's come in and I've had a few standard questions. So I've got a few of those listed at the end, but if you guys want to ask your own questions, that's the point of this as well. Um, so results since the last round, we brewed over 200 more unique beers, which I always like to include because it is part of what's different about Black Ops. We, we have a lot of creativity and innovation in the products that we, that we make. Um, we launched our second brewery, which I think is now pr probably by square meterage, the biggest independent brewery in Queensland. It's, least, it's the biggest that I can think of. We've got over 4,000 square meters of space there now that we can utilize. Um, Back when we did the crowdfunding, we could only make about half a million litres of beer a year. At the moment, we're doing over 2 million litres and the site will allow us to do over 10 million litres if we can grow to that stage, which, is, which means we're, we're in a really good position to grow into the future. Um, the financial year revenue went from 1.4 million to 13.5 million. 
Um, calendar year revenue, I think, went from 2.3 to 15.2. So our business is just unrecognizable from what it was when we first did crowdfunding. We're now nationally distributed. We're, we're a profitable business. Um, we've won a lot of awards. The, the, the highlight I put in there is Queensland Champion Brewery and Champion IPA twice, but there's been lots of things. Um, East Coast Haze, this beer here that I've got as my product placement today, um, is our second best-selling beer. We only launched it halfway through last year as a brand new beer. And Goat is our uh, best-selling beer, um, our best-selling in pack anyway. And that was only launched the year before. So we've, we've released two new beers in the last two years that uh, account for by far more of our sales than any other products. Um, our online business is going nuts as well, uh, you know, partly as a result of COVID and partly as a result of a lot of innovation throughout that COVID shutdown period. Um, we've acquired a brewery in Brisbane and we're now up to about 50 full-time equivalent staff, about 80 staff total. It was 23 back when we did the crowdfunding. I put seven beers in the hottest 100 because I wrote this before Saturday. Um, that was last year. This year, we've got six beers in the hottest 100, which is also a record equal most um, beers in the list this year. Um, we've got voted the number one brewery in Australia in the Beer Cartel Survey, and they haven't done that survey since, but hopefully we're still regarded as the, the number one in that format. Our online audience has grown a lot, and we've also launched a barrel age tap room and um, brand in AWOL. So there's a lot that's happened. This raise, uh, the valuation is worked out loosely based on the formula that we used before, which was about four times revenue. Actually, before it was quite a bit higher than that. And we we're talking about that with the virtual guys before this call that most people feel like this revenue, this valuation is very reasonable given the revenue growth we'd have. Um, but I, I, it's, it's really hard to tell with valuations. I just, I want people to see this as a good deal and I want people to look back on it as a good investment. like people do on the first investment. So we hope we've set that number about right. It feels about right. Uh, the share price is $3.77 and the minimum amount is 500,000. The maximum is 2.2 million. Last time the maximum was 400 and we hit that in six days. We definitely could have gone more. Um, and this time we, we want to do a big raise. If we can hit 2.2 million, it will be the biggest ever for a brewery in Australia in equity crowdfunding. And we like breaking records, so that would be nice. That said, I don't want you to invest just to help us break the record. I want you to see it as a good investment and invest for that reason. Um, investor rewards are very similar to last time. The, the minimum investment is $200, so we've got um, a 5% discount for everyone. All of these rewards go to all investors. Um, obviously, you get equity in the company. We have exclusive invites to events that we do. Um, we do an alpha team brew day every year, which is really fun. We get to brew a custom beer that only you guys can purchase. Um, we, I, I send out an email every quarter and you have access to me for any questions about Black Ops. Uh, we do exclusive alpha team merch, uh, custom bottle opener, key ring, shirts, that kind of thing, and early access to online beers. And if you invest a bit more, you get a slightly bigger discount. I don't really like to push discounts too much because I, I, don't, I don't really like the idea of taking money off a product that's already very expensive to make. So I don't push that too hard, but it is a discount that investors enjoy and applies to online and in the tap rooms as well. So here's a few of the charts. The, the green line is our revenue over the years. And, and you can see um, revenue is can be a little bit up and down, especially with our business where we do a bi-monthly limited release. So you can see as of last year, it's kind of month up, month, month down type situation for revenue. But overall, the growth has been very, very consistent and very considerable. Um, profitability, you can see, is, is difficult. And we got to profitability right when COVID hit. Um, and then throughout 2020, we had a very profitable year. We were running very lean. Um, it was pretty stressful and pretty challenging. And throughout 2021, we really invested in the team and in the infrastructure to grow. So it's, we're still profitable, but it's, it's tricky to invest in the future and still grow at 100% per year and remain profitable. But it's something that I really want as a, as a business to remain profitable. It's not, not something we want to dip back into being not profitable. Um, but we also want to keep up a, a pretty decent level of growth. And that growth puts us at number 24 in the Australian Financial Review, fastest growing companies in the country. Um, I don't think we'll keep growing at 100% per year, but we do say that every year. And every year we, <laughs> we end up growing by that much. Um, but I, I think it would, be, it would be almost impossible to grow at 100% at our current size. 
and definitely very stressful, but we still think we've got a lot of growth left in this, in this work. We're just scratching the surface, I think. Um, so that chart is keg sales. You can see pale ale is still our biggest selling keg. Um, East Coast Haze is getting very, very close. And we think East Coast Haze will, will be our best selling beer. And, and we thought that even before we launched it. And I think by this time next year, um, it'll be our flagship beer and our best selling beer. At the moment, it doesn't quite have the distribution, but it's still sitting there second behind pale. Um, and Lay Day is actually, actually a really good keg uh, beer for us throughout the summer as well. Um, and then Goat is not far behind and Sand it as a session I was pretty close as well. Most of our beer, however, these days, about 80% is in pack, not in cans. And you can see the package sales. Um, goat is our most distributed beer. So Goat and Pale uh, go out nationally to the most amount of venues and, and they're, they're our best sellers. But you can see East Coast Haze, even without national distribution, is just rapidly catching both of those beers. So if that gets picked up by the majors this year, which we hope it will, then I think I, I can see that becoming our best beer by a fair way. Um, and then Hornets there pretty close as well, not too far behind, which has a lot of distribution in the majors. And that line you can see there, which is kind of a ready maroni. What is that color? I don't know what that color is. But anyway, there's a line there that's a weird color and it goes like this. Um, that's our bi-monthly limited release. So on the off months, the beer is basically sold out. We don't sell much. And on the on the on months, you can see we actually sell a lot of cartons of those limited releases. Most of them are going into the majors. Basically, all of them are going into the majors now, um, and they're super popular for our indie bottle shops as well. Quick update on expansion. We're, we're growing from a, an eight-head inline, sort of, I guess, semi-entry level canning line, our, our current one, um, to a, a really proper 24-head uh, rotary CFT is the company out of Italy that make this canning line, the, the kind of canning line you would find at, you know, Bent Spoke or Gage Roads or Stone and Wood or Bolter. It's that, it's that same sort of speed, same sort of level as those canning lines. So it's a really, really big upgrade for us, but it puts us at that same level in terms of our ability to package beer. We've ordered six new big tanks, so we'll be fine for this year, kind of regardless of the growth. That's a, that's a hell of a lot more beer we can make. We have to move the tanks because we've got a different area to package in, which is a brand new shed. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of new sheds at BH2 we can take over uh, to expand into. We also have plans to launch a distillery if we hit the maximum target on this campaign. And we want to do that in one of the sheds at BH2 as well. So this is the floor plan. If, if you have been to BH2, um, this will make sense to you. If not, it, you know, it's just a generic floor plan. But if you look at the light green section, that's the original brewery. Um, and actually everything there that's green, light green or gray, we already occupy. Actually, except for those two sheds, on the bottom of that. The two gray ones on the bottom, we're not gonna take those two. Um, but the other gray ones there, we've, we've, we've already got, and we're just using them for storage at the moment. We'll probably sublease them out because we don't need the space, but it gives us basically double the amount of room at BH2 to expand into. So that was a really nice um, situation where the tenant moved out and we were able to take those sheds. So we've got a hell of a lot of room there. And that front one there at the bottom is where we're planning on putting the distillery. So that's one of the sheds at the front. That's um, actually, there's more stuff in there now because we've got another container on Friday night, which is all of our equipment, but we're just holding it there while we get the actual packaging shed ready, which is this shed. Um, and that's getting underway now. The drains were getting cut today and fabricated. Flooring's got to get done. And once that happens, we're moving all the equipment in and getting the guys in from Italy to come and commission this thing. And that's the layout for the packaging line. So it's yeah, it's 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 a pretty substantial upgrade from what we're currently doing. It's quite expensive. The whole project was about three million dollars. We funded the majority of this project already, but the, the crowdfunding will help us finish it off and help with more expansion in 2022 and just generally with cash flow as well. That's a <clears throat> more of a close-up of the machine. And the guys just went down to Bent Spoke uh, last week to check out their version because they got the exact same machine of just implemented it and um, that they were great to us, really looked after us and showed us around and, and they were able to see it firsthand, which was really cool. And the distillery is, yeah, this is an idea that we've been sitting on for a little while. We wanna do it, but it's gonna cost us money. So if we can get some money through the crowdfunding, we're gonna give this a go. We've already got a pilot still there that we've been playing around on. We've got the brand Pine Ridge ready to go. We wanna do gin and ultimately whiskey. Um, 
and we also want to do a tap room there on site at BH2 uh, that does you know gin, whiskey, cocktails, that kind of thing. Um, okay, I, I don't think we've got too many questions. Actually, I'll stop sharing my screen. Can we move to the format with everyone's face, or is that not possible? With everyone's face. Is that what happens, or is that, well, is that all, not what happens? Or 321. Well, I don't <laughs> know. What be. happens? I want, I want to see people. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Honestly, um, when it comes to it, the Q&A format. So, look, for anybody who's got any questions around any of this so far, please do pop your question in the Q&A. I think um, one part which I saw that you already um, sort of got yourself a, a little bit um, uh well, it was the next section that we were going to cover was the exit plan and, and what the ROI is. You've already had a question here around um, around the sort of return on investment and what that yeah. looks like for investors further down the line. I know that this is a question you're going to get a lot um, and there's a fair bit of amb ambiguity to it. But I'm sure yeah. once we start asking this question, I can see other questions come in. So yeah, we'll answer this. Yeah, one. well, first of all, that person... I love your question, but Matt Oakes said, sip your beer now, Dan. So I'm going to I'm going to take that one first because <laughs> that's a good point. I hope I'm not the only one drinking beer on this call. And if you're enjoying Black Ops beer, then cheers. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think if I just, I'll, I'll try and answer the questions on this Q&A. And then if we run out, I'll just answer the ones that I know are popular, but it'd be better to answer people's live questions if they have them. Uh they're going to be coming in for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Look, a, a question here. Um, so with this, is there any sort of ROI? Is it only for merch, team events, et cetera? Um, and a couple of yeah. other rewards, of course. There are rewards associated with it, but people are receiving equity in the business. So um, the return on investment is, of, of course, a question which investors want answered. Um, and I'm sure that you're in a better position than any to be able to kind of answer what this what the future of the Black Ops might look like as a result of investors coming on board uh, and owning shares in the company now. Yeah, I, the, the first thing I would say is, you know, investing in crowdfunding is risky and we do put that in the offer document because it is, this, this is still a high growth business. It's a very difficult business as well. There's a lot of moving parts when you're making a product yeah. um, and, um, you know, our business is growing as fast as any startup would ever grow. So to, to me, it's, 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 it's new, even though it's a business that's seven years old now. Um, so ROI is something like in terms of like giving you a specific number or percentage on return, I would never, ever do that. And I would never be thinking about this investment in, you know, comparing it to something like putting money in a bank and earning interest. Um, there, there, there's two ways that you will get an ROI from an investment in a company like this. Um, one is if the company paid dividends. And the other is if you sold your shares for more money than you bought them for. So, um, and that's putting aside, you know, the enjoyment of having shares and, and the discounts and, and the rewards and whatnot. Um, dividends is not something I think high growth companies should be doing. It, it's something that companies that are 20 years old that aren't growing much do because they've got free money and they can't think of anything better to do with it. And in our case, if we've got extra money, we have a massive list of projects that we could implement and keep growing the company and so, so I've told this to investors from day one that this is not the business to invest in if you want dividends. Um, now, in terms of, um, and, and not to say we, we wouldn't ever do dividends, there are craft brewers that do it. Coopers have been paying one for 30 years, I think. Um, and, you know, maybe we, we will one day get to the point where we're just comfortable and profitable and we're not growing anymore and we, and we do that. But, you know, I, I think that's a long way off. Yeah. Um, the, the, the share situation, so selling your shares for more money, there's a couple of aspects to this. One is it's very difficult to do in a private company um, unless you find, you know, your own person you want to sell them to. For sure. There's a couple of options for us. One is one day to look at listing on the ASX. Um, and I actually had a conversation with someone who reached out as a result of this crowdfunding just today about that. Um, it's something that's on my radar, but I'm, but it's not, it's not really something I'm working on actively at this point. And, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, the other option is if we change our structure to a public unlisted company, which is much easier, um, and that would enable us to get investors the ability to buy and sell shares. Um, what I would say to all of that, though, is that we don't actually have a lot of investors who want to sell their shares. And every year I survey our investor group, and um, I think something like 
85 or 90% said they wouldn't sell their shares. And that was not even considering what, how much they would get to them, get for them. And a lot of these investors would get a lot um, because they invested very early on. Um, so while we don't have a lot of investors who want to sell shares, it won't be a priority for me to set up the functionality for them to be able to do that. Um, but because there's downsides with doing it, there's a lot more regulation and, and things that yet that come along with being public. Um, but that's something I monitor all the time. I'm always talking to investors. I'm really conscious of the fact that you don't invest in a company for nothing. You, you do want to get a return eventually. Um, and at some point, if it makes sense for us to list or go do public unlisted for any number of reasons, one of which is that we have a lot of investors saying, hey, I think you guys are smashing it and I'd like to get a return on my original investment, then, then we would look at doing that. Um, the other possibility is if, if the, the laws change to allow our private companies to kind of buy and sell shares, yeah. which is the only reason we're doing crowdfunding right now is because the laws change to allow private companies to do crowdfunding. So that's that's a possibility as well. Yeah, awesome. um, yeah if, 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 am I able to ask if they, they're happy with the response and just to, you know, if they got any further questions, I guess they'll ask yeah. another one. I would, um, I would absolutely say that the, the response might come through. Since answering that question, you've just had another 24 questions asked it. So cool. uh, Sorry. yeah, there's quite, quite a few more, but no, I'm not uh, in any way telling you to rush it because I think that the content is so valuable and I think it's so important to, to cover that in so much detail because as you say, this is an investment into a private company um, and people need to be responsible about it. That being yeah. said, I think that your narrative for remaining independent as a company is also a really strong piece because ultimately people are maintaining shares into a company whereby your objective isn't just to sort of prop this company up and then sell it very fast. That's not your aim and it hasn't been your aim from the get-go. Uh, yeah. And uh, ultimately, I think that we can revisit this a bit, a bit further down the line um, if there's any more particularly detailed questions. Um, Shane here has asked a question. So Shane Morgan, thanks for ask, asking a question. Just wondering if you could offer commentary on what is observed as revenue trending up and profit trending down. Yeah, there's, there's a fair bit to that. I'd say a massive part of it is um, back when we first hit profitability, when COVID hit, we were sitting at about 40% keg sales and 60% package sales. Um, that, that has really flipped with COVID. So our business now is mainly selling canned stock into Dan Murphy's. So it was, it, we went from sort of mainly Indies to mainly Dan mm. Murphy's. Mm. Um, and so margins go down as a result of that. So that's, that's part of the story. It's not the whole story. Um, the other part of it, is especially the last calendar year, is we've the tap rooms have not had a good three months during the, the time of the year um, when that is kind of your money making time, like December, yeah. January, October, November, like that period is when your tap rooms really should be cranking. And we didn't have a good run of it in those months. And really, I, I would put it down almost 100% to COVID and what was going on with COVID. Yeah. Um, it's probably not the only reason like like hq in burley has a lot more competition now so i think we've, we've felt that um but the tap room makes up a good chunk of your profitability and when and when the tap rooms are not performing as you want them to that's a big hit um the other one is we've really changed the way we do production at black ops we've got a big production team we've got a big site now um and we've, we've sort of we're building and planning ahead for a lot more growth and that's come at a cost. And um, I guess that it's also come as a benefit though that, don't, that doesn't turn up in, in the PL, which is we're now operating as a business with, you know, we've got a HR person, we've got a safety person, we've got a production team that isn't massively overworked. We've got a much safer workplace, a much friendlier workplace. Um, staff are happier. Like this kind of stuff is not really things you measure in a PL, but when you're going from startup mode to established business mode, um, you just can't run on fumes forever. Yeah. And so I'm conscious of that profit going down um, and I don't enjoy it and I do lose sleep over it. <laughs> One yeah. of many things. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty confident we've made ma mainly the right decisions with that and um, we'll, we'll get that under control and, and keep it above that line. Um, although I, I don't think we will go back to the sort of percentage profit levels we were in 2020 until we get much more volume because we've built the brewery to make a lot more beer than it's currently making. So, yeah, awesome. um, yeah I, think, I think that will correct itself with time and volume. Um, but also I think those, those profit levels probably aren't quite sustainable if you want to have a good 
happy, healthy, you know, sustainable business. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, yeah, it's a different time. And uh, ultimately those months, which you, the tap rooms would have been thriving. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think everybody can, can look at that and say circumstances were not the same and usual as they should have been. Um, but yeah, just in looking at some of these questions that we've got through, we've got an anonymous attendee has asked around some of the net zero potential um, targets that you might have. Do you have a carbon positive plan? If so, what, did it, what is it? What's your current position and how do you plan to deliver it? I think I'll ask that first, just so you can ask, ask uh, answer that. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. No, we do not have a specific net zero plan. Um, we, we do work on a fair bit in relation to sustainability. We have a few different things we do. Um, Govs has kicked off a sustainability committee that meets every few months to go through different ideas of things we can work on. But they're, they're, they're on, admittedly only smaller things at the moment. Um, things like we help with beach cleanups, things like that. Um, we donate money to different charities. Like we, we donated money to Crumbin Wildlife last month. We do a, a fair bit of that kind of stuff. We've got solar panels across the whole brewery roof at BH2. And we'll probably look at putting panels across the new roof as well, but they've changed the way that works. When we, when we implemented that, they had a good deal where they could basically put it in there and then give us a discounted rate as opposed to us buying them. Mm. Um, and as you can see from our P&L, we, you know, we just don't have spare money for anything. So yeah. um, that's the kind of thing that we are keen to do, but, but we don't have a specific plan for it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I can, I can read these other questions. I can see them there. Yeah, of course. Well, look, I mean, like the question kind of continues on the vein of um, local supply, supply of raw materials. Um, where's the company in regarding to the understanding of the supply chain accountability? Um, is the business of measuring ESG? Um, and do you have a CSR program? Uh, I'm sure, yeah, I mean, these are all things that you might have considered. I'll, I'll let you answer the rest of the question. Yeah, to be honest, I don't even know what ESG stands for. So I don't have a good answer for that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it sounds like this person does. So I'm always happy to, to hear ideas. Yeah, awesome. um, our, our mode has been, you know, grow, stay in business, set up, set up for the future. And we, we started a community program a couple of years ago. We're doing small, small amounts of donations and things like that. Um, but, you know, we don't have a lot of budget for this kind of stuff. So this is mm. something we're definitely keen on. Um, in terms of local ingredients, that's sort of dictated more by the products you make like like we, we definitely do have a good focus on local ingredients in terms of um a lot of our fruit and additive suppliers are, are local um uh malt a lot of them most of the malt is local um things like hops we actually we are actually doing a, a beer with um hilltop hops in brisbane at the moment which is a, a local collab but again like it's hops are dictated more or less by the product like a lot of our hops are from not from Queensland. Um, it's just the nature of the kind yeah. of hops that go into that style of beer. So it is something we're conscious of. We get actually something that people don't think of a lot is packaging. Like the bulk of stuff we buy is packaging and we get all of our boxes and our cans all printed and manufactured from busy up the street. Um, and that's not, not only good that it's a local supplier, um, but they're actually quite good. They're quite good. We can get the we can get the cans and the boxes pretty cheaply, pretty quickly, and it's something that makes sense for us. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of our approach to it. I'm sure it's not the answer that person wants, but that's 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 the honest answer. It is something we care about, but um, it yeah. hasn't been our number one priority, and it is something we're currently working on. Of course, of course, of course. And Matt Oaks here says, "Legend on the Super Hornets uh, over there." Uh -huh. Great to hear, Matt. I'm not uh, messing absolutely, around. Absolutely, yeah, not messing around at all. Uh, I do love the Super Hornets. Um, awesome. Um, Warren here has asked, uh, "How has a war gone? Would it be? Um, will it be put on the back burner? Um, what impact, positive or negative, has it had on the revenue profitability of the business overall?" Yes, good question. Um, AWOL was always a, definitely an experiment because it, there wasn't a barrel aged beer tap room in Queensland. Um, definitely not in the Gold Coast. The Gold Coast is a pretty new craft beer market. So we were never quite sure how well it was going to go. Mm. Um, the product, the tap room was well received in terms of you know, people giving it good reviews. People love going there. Um, the product has been well reviewed, um, but there has been some lessons. One, one is that tap room has not performed particularly well over COVID. Um, hmm. And we also haven't got very favorable hours there. 
and a lot of the other businesses in the area do. So pretty much everyone else can open till 10 o'clock at least and we have to close at six o'clock. Yeah. Um, right. And that's that's something that's really annoying. And we could add, you know, we kind of made the decision that we're gonna we're gonna pull back and work with council to get that changed and then reopen AWOL because it's the feedback has been that it, it suits being a nighttime venue when we've already got a good daytime venue with Black Ops next door. Yeah. Um, impact on the revenue, very, very minimal. Um, I think AWOL tapering was about 1% of our revenue. It's, it's not a lot compared to the overall business. Um, mm -hmm. But profitability, yeah, it, it hasn't been profitable. Um, so it's, it's hurt our taproom profitability a little bit. Yeah. Um, as for uh, positive or negative, I, I think AWOL is going to be great. And I actually like, I like the idea of trying this new format where we open it up for beer launches. We've already got inquiries for special events. Um, we'll, we'll do things like our birthday there. Um, and we'll do all of that until we get more favorable hours and open it up as a bit of a special thing, you know, like do yeah. investor tastings and things like that. And um, I think that, I think that will be great for the AWOL brand. And we're, we're mm. going to start wholesaling AWOL as well, which um, we never have. Um, so it'll be sort of specialty bottle shops, specialty bars um, who can get access to some of those products. And it does take a while to make these beers too. We've got beers coming out now that have been in there for over a year and that are just starting to come good. Um, so I'm, overall, I'm quite um, optimistic about AWOL as a brand and the tap room. Um, yeah. But it's, it, as, it, as it stands, it wasn't performing very well. So that's why we, we closed it to uh, private events. Yeah, understood. Understood. Well, Dawn has asked a question around AWOL as well, which you've already covered. Um, but then the second part of the question is, can you give us some of your viewpoint on all of the cultural issues on BrewDog, um, yeah. their big expansion, and some of the beer, um, and some of the beer is a man's games issue. How are you working on culture in Black Ops? I know that this is actually a really important part of the business, so I'm really, uh, yeah, intrigued. Yes. Yeah, love that, to hear your answer on this. I, I think that's a great question. Um, I... I'm actually, I actually have a background in HR, but it was so long ago that I, I shouldn't be trusted in a HR role anymore. So that's why we, that's why we employed a HR person. And we were actually told by our consultant that we were way too small to have a HR person. We wouldn't need someone, um, but we felt we needed someone because we could see that the business was growing so fast and, you know, issues were popping up and especially safety and HR. It's just, it's critical. And, um, so I, I think we're in a really good position with this stuff. I think we have a great culture. We survey the staff every six months and ask them for their feedback. We, you know, we have in-person conversations with staff. Um, we do lots of things. We, we do sort of six monthly team events. We do at the annual Christmas party. We do 12 month team beers, things like that that people like. Um, we, we are working actively to make sure people aren't working too many hours, which I think we're, we're actually doing all right on. Um, but, you know, as a startup business, like, you know, we, and, and, I, and I know you mentioned BrewDog there and I, I've read some of the stuff about their expansion and um, you, you start a business and it's all hustle, but you kind of forget that the, the people working for you, you know, are not owners of the business and they're not the people who started it and they want a job. They don't want the stress of being an entrepreneur. So um, we're super conscious of that. Um, and I think we're doing pretty well on that and it's, it's ongoing. Um, the, the BrewDog question, I, it's, I just, it bums me out because when we started, BrewDog was a brand that we really looked up to. They, they did, you know, they did that kind of TV show that we, we were, like, used to watch it. It was so cool. Um, we met one of the founders, came over uh, to Australia and came to our brewery and met him. He was, like, honestly, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Um, mm. Martin was the founder. Um, and then you read all this stuff and, and, you know, it's just, it's just so shit to read that. So I don't, I don't know. I, it sucks, but yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, I uh, couldn't agree more. Um, but, but, but I do, I will say that, that what I've read is shit. And if, you know, and if that's true, that that's not, that's not ever going to be what it's like. I get a company that I, that I run. Yeah, totally. But but totally. you know, I, I do I do worry that sometimes that but in this case, there's a lot of staff members members have come out and said this, which is really troubling. And I don't want to bag out another brewery because because I, I do like Brewdog, yeah. but um, yeah, it, it's it's not cool. And I think I think the industry over here is well and truly on top of that. Like they know it's not cool, um, and you know stuff like that gets called out pretty quickly mm. here. I, I mm. think we're 
were pretty good on that front. Um, but yeah, it bums me out for sure. And, and shouldn't that shit shouldn't go on in any industry. Definitely, definitely. All right, so Richard here has asked a question. Um, hi Dan, do you see any risks to the craft beer sector in the near term? Yes, um, I think, I mean, there's, there's risk to any business. So I think, you know, I think being in business is risky full stop. Um, and the other thing I'd say about risk is, you know, like we did, we did our risk section for our last crowdfunding in 2019 and nowhere on there did we put, you know, maybe there's gonna be a global pandemic that completely screws up hospitality in the whole industry. And so with risk, you, you just don't, you just don't know. Um, but in terms of the craft beer sector, I think, I think the big thing is um, alcohol consumption generally is declining. And that's always been the case as long as we've had a business. Um, there is a lot more, but craft has been growing a lot. And I, I, as far as I can see, it still is like our business is still very, very much growing. Um, but there is a lot more products and a lot more competition now. And I think that that competition has definitely come from other breweries. Um, but the competition from the majors is pretty extreme now. Like if you, when we started, the major breweries, you know, weren't making good craft beer. The, the best craft beer they made was probably Little Creatures, which is a damn good beer, but it really wasn't as good as the Bolters and the Pirate Lifes and the Black Ops, if, if you ask me, I'm a bit biased. But um, now the majors own Pirate Life, they own Stone, Stone and Wood, they own Bolter, they own Green Beacon, they own Four Pines, they own Feral, all of these brands uh, are some of the best brands in the country and they've now got unlimited budgets and um, unlimited capacity. And as, as you can see from the, from the Hottest 100 on the weekend, if you follow that, they're still resonating with consumers. You know, people still like Stone and Wood Pacific Ale and Bolter XPA and Feral, Biggie Juice and, and all the other ones. Um, so there's a hell of a lot more competition now. Um, mm. I think we're, and from other products as well, there's sort of um, a, lot of, a lot of different products coming out with um, seltzers and, you know, gins and all kind of crafts, any kind of craft spirits they're taking off. So there is a lot more competition. I, I guess I, I, what I would say to that is that I think we're in a really good position now because we are one of the bigger independent breweries and Definitely. we did in hindsight get in pretty early. It didn't feel early at the time, but... If you, if you look at where we are now, it, it kind of shows you that when we started making beer in 2014, it was actually very early when it comes to craft beer. Um, and we're now kind of one of the more established brands. Um, so I think we're, we're in a good position to kind of weather that storm, but it, that doesn't make the risk go away, but that's, I think we're in a good position for it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm taking another I, sip too, because I assume one of the next questions is take a sip. Well, actually, I did see that further down. Okay. And I've just been, um, for everybody who's asking questions, I am trying to get to some of them and just answering um, any of the sort, sort of detailed ones that I can answer. But right now, Dan, the questions are coming in thicker and faster than we can yeah. answer them. So we'll do our very best to get through as, as many of these questions as possible for everybody who's here. Um, and uh, if we have to go over a little bit, so be it. We've um, yeah both got nothing after this, so we can we can crack on through the questions. So thank you very much to everybody who's asking them. Um, Glenn here has said the distillery gin whiskey market down here in Tasmania is nearly saturated. Is the market different up north? How do you see your product being different to what's out there? Yes, good question. Um, I think the markets being saturated is something that's really hard to tell, and I don't I don't know a lot about the market down there. But you know we were we were told when we started our brewery in 2016 that, you know, craft beer was getting saturated and there wasn't much room for anything else. And in hindsight, we were super, super early. And it's really, really, really hard to know. Um, what I would say in Queensland is, is craft gin especially has gone nuts in Queensland. Um, not actually that much on the Gold Coast. There's a few distilleries. I, I, I know, I think all of them, um, as far as I can tell, they're all doing very well. Um, in the north end of the Gold Coast, where we're planning on doing it, I don't think there's any. Um, and I think that's a good thing because I think that area responded really well to a brewery and I think will respond pretty well to a distillery. Yeah. Um, almost no one is doing whiskey in Queensland uh, for reasonably obvious reasons. It's not, it's not the best climate for making whiskey. Um, yeah. My mates, there are a few people doing it. My mates at Granddad Jacks have, have, have done a couple. We've actually done a collab with Husk in uh Tumbulgum in northern New South Wales who do the ink gin. They're also making whiskey and, and they did a, their first batch with stone and wood two years ago and we put a batch down with them a year ago and it's just going to sit there. We're going to get a, one barrel of that and it's going to sit there for like six or seven years. Um, 
there's another place in Byron doing whiskey. There's, there's a couple, but not like Tassie. We, we, we've talked to guys like um, Lark a bit um, down there. We, we do a, a um, barrel aged beer using their barrels um, and, you know, pretty inspired by what they're doing down there. Um, so that's part of why we want to do this. I, th I think whiskey is a whiskey is just a perfect product for breweries to be making because it's, it's effectively distilled beer and um, we're pretty good at making beer. And we've got the infrastructure to be pretty patient with um, storing barrels and, and sitting around for whiskey to be, to be ready. Also, um, I like the name Black Malt, which uh, makes a lot of sense. The brewery's called Black Hops and I like that as a, as a name for a whiskey. Um, so we've been thinking about this for a while and yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think, I wouldn't describe the market here as saturated. It is getting very, very popular, um, but where we are at BH2, there's not a whole lot there. Mm. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, and Dan here below has uh, said, what's the current time frame for all the implementation of these plants, uh, for, the in for implementation of all these plants um, that you've described? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I was saying to the virtual guys before this call that the way we like to do things is we don't like to overcommit. And that's why at the start of this presentation, we had a big list of things that we've achieved since the first crowdfunding that we didn't promise anyone we would achieve. All we promised with that first crowdfunding was that we would open a second brewery. And by the time that crowdfunding was closed, we were 90% of the way through opening that brewery. Um, we didn't want to be one of those companies that kind of says, these are all our plans and this is the money we need and then realize they don't have enough and it, it doesn't go to plan. Um, so most of these plans are pretty advanced with the exception of the distillery. Yeah. Um, the packaging line, we started the project back in, I think, April last year. It's a long process getting your packaging line made in Italy and sent over here. Um, all of the equipment has arrived already and it's sitting there in the shed. And it was delayed a little bit because we couldn't get access to the shed, but that, that is well and truly underway. I think the guys from Italy are set to come over at the end of February. I think we don't have the exact dates yet. And they're here for about six weeks. So I think by the end of March, we should be getting really close to having that fully operational. Um, the distillery is different. We're only going to do the distillery if we hit our maximum um, amount in this campaign. And we've got the shed. It's sitting there ready to go. And we've got the brand. Um, and we've got the pilot recipes. So we can kind of push the go button on building the distillery reasonably quickly once we get the money. But I don't think we will sort of rush it out I'd, I'd say best case uh, yeah I, I don't really want to commit to a time frame for that but all we're saying in there is we, is we will kick it off if we if we get the maximum yep. um and we also have an expansion of the cellar which is the the big tanks we have arriving um and they're already ordered we've paid the deposit on those they're getting manufactured at the moment um they'll probably be here i'm guessing around april something like that and that's just a case of bolting them onto the to the cellar so that, that'll happen within a, a you know a few days of them of them getting here, a few weeks of them getting here. Yeah, that's great. And Matt below has asked a question literally around the tier and level of crowdfunding and pretty much answered it in the same way that you've answered it, um, saying level one, funding new building and canning. Um, obviously, we know that that's going to happen, um, even with the lower amount. And then level two, small batch distillery, but you mentioned that you'll only do this the distillery at the maximum amount, um, and then yeah. level three. So. Yeah, thanks very much for asking the question, Matt. Hopefully that's answered it for you. Yeah, that oh, he, he says in there three levels. I, I would really just say there's two. There's, if we yeah. hit the maximum, yeah, yeah. we will build the distillery. If we don't, we'll just continue with, with the normal plans. Absolutely, absolutely. There's an anonymous attendee here who said, didn't get a chance to read the whole slide for the perks um, for investors. Is there a discount for purchasing beer as an investor, direct purchase of kegs for home, et cetera? Um, just for any questions around the rewards, the full details will be in the offer document, which you will be able to see tomorrow. Um, so in section 3.1, uh, when you can head to the offer page, you can see all the details for the rewards. Yeah, I can answer the percentage discount though, because that, that's an easy one. Um, so for people who invest $200, they get a 5% discount. Yeah. If you invest over 2,000, you get a 7.5% and it's a 10% if you invest 10,000 and over. Um, easy. And look, it's, to, to be honest, like, like I said, said before, like the discount is not a big part of it for me. Um, I, I think it's great that investors get to feel special and get a bit of a good deal. Um, but I, I really do want people investing to be part of the journey and to, because they think it's a good investment. That's, that's what, what is the most important thing for me. In terms of kegs at home, um, there's a business that does this. We actually trialed this during COVID and found that it was way too hard for us to do. Mm. There is a, a, a business called Kegs 
at home or kegs off tap or something, I think they're called. Um, and we supply them. So you can buy Black Ops beers if you want a keg at home, but we don't do it directly. We just found it too hard to, to maintain the um, kegerators and to, to get the deliveries done during the day, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, you know, special uh, kegs for investors, it's just not possible. We're, we're a too big a company now. And, um, you know, we've already got 550 investors and this one, I'm guessing we're going to get a thousand, maybe 2000 more. Um, so, so no, we don't yeah. do that. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And Nick here has asked the question, are you able to provide a revenue and profit forecast for the next two to three years? Um, I will say that um, in the offer document, you won't see a forecast as such in the financial section, um, more purely because of the fact that being trans open and transparent and not being um, misleading is, is really about providing what is historical and present in the business right now. Um, and so the offer document has to be as factual as possible. Um, you won't see uh, like a, a, a revenue forecast for the next two to three years in there. Dan, I know that you're talking about some of your plans for the future and what you're looking to do. Um, I'm sure that you probably, like you've been saying, um, you'll have some of these plans, but then again, you, you want to under promise and, and over deliver is your, your motto really for um, growing the business. Yeah, I think so. And, and we, we do have a forecast that like you say, it's not something um, that generally gets shared in something like this because it's, you know, it's just like, well, I, I do the forecast, we update it constantly. It, it goes, it doesn't go three years out because to be honest with you, there would be no point in doing that. It's just absolutely impossible to predict. Yeah. Um, but we go 12 months out and we have a whole range of different ways. We use an app called Futurely, which if you're into accounting stuff, it connects with zero, enables you to put calculations in for different expected outcomes. Um, and I, I look at it every month. I get a report from the accountant which is called the CFO report, where it looks at our expenses and our revenue and where it's different to the forecast. And then I work with him to update the forecast for the month ahead, which updates the 12 months ahead. Um, but it's just, it's never, never right. And I don't think it's because we're bad at forecasting. I just think it is just, it's an, un, it's an unpredictable business when you're growing at 100% a year, or even if it's 20% a year. Um, you know, you're talking about you, you're talking about one or two more products just to change everything, or you know, the COVID thing takes off and the tap rooms, you know, go down for a couple of months. It changes everything. So it is something I do. We do it regularly, um, but yeah, we don't put it in the document, and we, we do use it for things like signing um, contracts for hops and things. But it just changes so often that it's like you just couldn't forecast two or three years out. I wish you could. It would make things a lot easier. But then if it was easy. Then everyone would be doing it. So exactly, and in, but even forecasts are challenging in any environment. But this in this environment, it's like it's near on impossible. I think for every single business, and even um, even in virtual itself, which is a startup, like forecasting and trying to put any kind of plan together that's further than six or twelve months is just impossible. Yeah, uh, I, so, I will say to to, yeah. to Nick's question, um, I don't think we're going to grow at the rate we have grown at, and that's. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, a lot of the work we're doing is making sure we're comfortable and, and we're focusing on quality and the team's happy, that kind of stuff. I think if we can grow at 20 to 30%, that would be a really good outcome. We're not going to go from 80 staff to 160 staff a year from now. I just don't think that's going to happen. And I think that's fine. Um, you know, if businesses, I remember when Stone and Wood were kind of going, going through their growth when they were sort of 10 odd years into it and they were growing at 20% a year, I think if you if you get to a decent size and you're profitable and you're growing at something like 20% a year, I think that's best case scenario. Yeah. Um, so I think our growth will reduce best case scenario. It's not 100% because that would be too mm. stressful for everybody. Um, yeah. If it's 20 to 30%, then that I'll be very happy with that. And that's that's what I'm hoping for. And I guess I guess you could say expecting with a big yeah. asterisk beside it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Adam here has asked the question, what do you see as your main threats and weaknesses with your future expansion plans as a business? And I'm sure you could spend a lot of time on this, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to, uh, yeah, to answer. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, the, we, we do detail risks in the offer document, so you can check that out. Um, I, I'd say the biggest thing is we are building um, a big production facility uh, that supports a lot more production than we currently have. So if you look at our current production, we're sitting at about 2.2 million litres. Um, I don't think there's a brewery in the country doing that volume with this packaging line. 
as far as I know, actually, perhaps Ben spoke, I actually don't know how much volume they do, but um, this upgrade we're doing is very big. We've got a, we've got a big brew house, we've got a big cellar, we've got a very big packaging line, um, and we've got a team that's built for growth. So if, if we don't grow at all, then that's definitely a risk. Um, we've got a lot of expensive equipment there that, that will be underutilized if we don't grow and a lot of square meterage if we don't grow. Um, I'd probably say that's the biggest risk. We, we do have the ability to um, sublease out those sheds, which we probably will do to save on rent if we don't need the space. Um, and I mean, the, the canning line is also a big step up in quality too. So it's not like it's a bad thing to have if you're doing 2 million litres. Um, it actually would have been nice to have it for this calendar year, but it is a very big upgrade. So I'd say that's probably a bit of a bit of a threat. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, and Ross here has said, given you release so many different beers each year, um, does that impact on profitability compared to other breweries? Um, do you think in the long term, the product range will become smaller and more focused as a business? Um, yeah, I, I would say like our experimental beers don't really go outside of the tap room um, and profitability, not so much because we do do calculations on those beers. We kind of work out how much they cost to make. We charge a lot more for them because they cost a lot more to make. We sell most of them directly, which is, which is nice and profitable or online. Um, so that sort of stuff, we're pretty well on top of it. We definitely could be better with costing out inventory and, and beer and whatnot, but we're, we're pretty on top of that. Um, the overall range that we sell, I mean, definitely you would say that it would be way easier to have one product. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, was, it was always the criticism of Stone and Wood that they only had one product. And, yeah. um, you know, I thought, well, that's awesome. <laughs> it's good. It would make things so much easier. Um, but that's not in our DNA. You know, we're... We're a business that makes a lot of different beers, and I'm I'm actually really proud of that. I think I think our core range does tend to get a bit long and out of hand sometimes, um, but that's in our DNA, and, and that's something I'm proud of. And I don't think it will change. I, I don't think our core range will get any bigger, and it might get a bit smaller. We might ditch some of the the, the beers that aren't performing too well. Um, but if you look at that sort of hottest 100 list, which I think is a good gauge of what you know people's sort of hearts and minds in craft beer. We've had four beers in that top 20 in the last two years. Um, Pale Ale, Hornet, East Coast, Haze and Goat. And I actually haven't looked, but I doubt that any other brewery has that. We've, we've, two years in a row, we've had, <clears throat> we've had the most beers in the list. Um, and I think that's awesome. I think that's really good that we have more than one beer that people love. And um, it makes people love the brand as opposed to loving the product. And um, it would be easier if that wasn't the case, but that is the business that, that we're in and, and that is not something I intend on changing. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Um, and you've got two questions below, both anonymous attendees, but um, yeah, they're so similar. I'm going to batch them into one. I'm interested in two, why you're using uh, equity crowdfunding versus normal capital markets. Um, and then and the other question goes on to ask, after seven years, um, have you looked at debt financing? Is this due to kind of your cash flow position and your operating um, your operating profit and revenue graph, uh, yep. perhaps not being as favorable to, to debt financing itself. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you've explored a number of these different options. Uh, yes, we, we act, we're actively doing both. So, so we have um, we've got a good relationship with Judo. We've got debt finance through Judo um, and have done ever since we um, launched BH2. So it's something, so, so we are actively doing both. Um, and we've also done private rounds. The last one we did was at the start of 2020, at the start of COVID, and we raised $1.6 million in under a week just from existing investors and just from me sending them an email and getting them in a room and having a chat to them. So there's a really, really healthy appetite for people. And that was during a pandemic, <clears throat> just, just as the pandemic hit was when that round was closing. Um, so there's a very good appetite for people investing in Black Hops. I love crowdfunding. I always have. It's, it was something I waited around for years for it to be legal. I wanted to be one of the first breweries to do it. I think it perfectly aligns with our brand. And, you know, my investors asked me, just, listen, just the other day, one of them says, I still don't understand why you want to do crowdfunding and not just get more investment from us. But I think it's a really good thing for the industry. I think it's a good thing for our perfect fit for our brand. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to just get debt because we don't want to have millions of dollars of debt. Um, I also don't like giving up equity, you know, like what we, we started Black Ops with 100% equity and we're down to about 51% between the three founders. So you don't want to just do equity um, finance. So you want to do a bit of a balance of both. And I think we've, we've done both, try to balance it out. This round, I think if we get a bit more debt finance, 
for the equipment and max out this round, I think we'll be in a really healthy position with finances. And that'll be nice because as a startup over the years, there's been a lot of times where we definitely didn't have enough money and that was very stressful. So um, yeah, I, I like to do both. And um, I think they both have pros and cons. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Probably goes without saying that, that I love the aspect of crowdfunding, which is we're getting people in who aren't traditional investors and yeah. they're, they're supporting our brand and they're voting for us. And you know, if you see them at the tap room, they engage with us online. That's the stuff I love. I think it's great for our brand. And that's, that's why I like doing crowdfunding. I love the comments as soon as we uh, as soon as we post about it and launch the Black Ops round coming back again. Like everybody's just so excited, and I can imagine that people are coming into your tap room just saying, "Like I've been waiting for this, Dan. Yes. Like I'm I'm yeah. so pumped to be able to come in and invest and own shares in the business." Um, yeah, it is. It's actually a lot of work too. I mean, I would do it more often. And 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 no offense to you because you guys are legends, but doing an equity crowdfunding campaign is more difficult than me sending an email to 50 investors and asking them for more money. So that, that kind of weighs on your mind as well, but it's, it's pros and cons. Yeah, totally, totally. So Mark here has asked, um, said there have been some craft breweries who have sold out to um, established international players upon the brand growth and portfolio development. Um, is the executive board and planning to remain independent or sell out, for example, Asahi and Green Bacon? Um, yeah. I know that you've talked about this a lot. Over to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I... I've got a, a good big long article in our blog about this. Um, I, I probably should, I could put it in the chat actually. Um, it's called the challenges of the challenge of staying independent. Um, so I think this captures all of my thoughts on it. I don't know. If, can I actually just chuck this into the chat? Will everyone see? Go it? for it. Just make sure that um, if you're you're adding it then you make sure that all panelists and attendees can see it. Um, if not, I can absolutely um, send it in. There you a go, I just did everyone. So hopefully that works. Perfect. Um, Perfect. Yeah, so, but I mean, our, our, my position on, on it is that I don't particularly want to sell. I think independence is important. I like the fact that we've got a good business making stuff in Australia. Um, I would like to be profitable. I always looked up to Stone and Wood being an independent company that seemed like they, they didn't have to sell. Um, and I, I love the guys from Stone and Wood. I think they're legends, but it does bum me out a bit that they sold. Um, I, you know, I think if you're looking to invest in a brewery that sells, yeah. this is it's not the one to, to invest in. Yeah. Um, but I also would say, you know, the exit, I suppose the exit is what people talk about is the, is the exit opportunity. I like the idea of staying profitable and staying as a solid business indefinitely. Potentially a, an IPO is an outcome that would allow us to do that. Yeah. Um, but the, the other thing I would say is um, I would never, especially after seeing what happened with Stone and Wood, I would never say we will never sell. And, and I've talked to most of those big companies already. I've talked to Lion Nathan and Coke and all of that before. I, you know, I, I haven't been in contact with them. It doesn't hurt to talk to them. It doesn't hurt to know where you're at. It's just not an outcome that I think really suits our business. And it's not really one that I want. Um, but it's also not something you would ever rule out because I think a lot of the times the founders kind of just decide, you know what, um, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, and yeah. if that's the case and you don't feel like you've got a good hand over plan, then maybe you, know, maybe you would sell. But it's, yeah. it's not an outcome that I'm particularly fond of personally. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Before we do, do move on to another question, I will say to everybody who is here who might have to go, um, we are recording this session. I will send it around to everybody who um, does have to move on to anything else. We've got 82 open questions, Dan. So there's a lot right, more I will, here I will try to answer these no, 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 no. Well, um, all I'm just, just going to say to everybody is thank you so much for the, the questions and genuinely engaging. Uh, I'm really loving the chat that we're having. So yeah, thank you very much for coming along. Um, we'll do our very best to get through all of these questions and I'll make sure that I can type answers to, to people if um, some of the questions require a lot more detail. So yeah. Um, why are you looking at diversifying into gin and whiskey from an anonymous uh, from an anonymous attendee? Yeah, I, I would say that the, the two reasons. One is um, I think where we are at BH two is a really good location to do a, a gin and, and whiskey distillery. Um, the other thing is, is we're all pretty keen on the idea of doing whiskey because we think it's a great fit for our brand, and uh, we think a brewery like ours that's got a big site, um, you know, a good hit track record of making high quality beer. Um, and the ability to kind of store the whiskey, a you know, decent enough size business to be able to store it, a decent amount of it, 
um, is a really nice fit for us. And I think it works really well with the brand. So that, that, that's the main reason. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, okay, great. And Scott here has said, based on your previous growth, both sales and building expansion, what is the target with regards to staffing overheads um, has a certain number been factored in? Yeah, it, it, like we don't really tend to target staff. I sort of look at, I look at a percentage that we're spending on wages. I keep my eye on that. Um, and we try to keep that under control. So as the business grows, we try not to hire people that throw that percentage out because if we do that, it kind of screws with our PL and, and puts us in a bad position. Um, but yeah, it, it's not something, it's not something we specifically put in in terms of we're going to be hiring this many people. It's more like we could hire 50 people right now, but yeah. um, like we can't afford to. So sure. as the business grows, we try to do that gradually and keep that percentage in check so we keep some profitability there. Sure. And I look at that every month. And once that looks more healthy, we start considering hiring more staff. For sure, for sure. Awesome. Um, and Craig here has said, do previous investors have preferential shares above this launch? Um, so yeah, yeah no. Um, Dan, yeah. Yeah, ahead. no. Um, so, well, I mean, in terms of the shares, all shares are the same. So the shares that you guys get are the same shares that I own. Um, I own a lot more of them because it would cost you a lot of money now to buy the amount of shares that I have. Um, and likewise, with people who invested early, especially at like our first two investors invested before we even had anything, um, those guys have exactly the same shares, but they have a shitload of them and they're worth a lot of money um, because the valuation was nowhere near what it is now. So depending on when you invest, I guess the benefit you get is that if the business grows and goes up, then your shares are worth more and more. But the actual shares themselves yeah. um, are not different to the shares that the founders or the original investors have. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, Alan Hayes, thanks very much for your question. How does the current share price compare to the original alpha first investment? Yeah, so current share price is $3.77. The original crowdfunding was $1.18. Yeah. Awesome. So the value, I think the valuation went from $18 million to $65 million. And, and the, the business has grown by more than that percentage by, by a fair decent margin. Yeah, I think and Alan I... is one of our original investors too, by the way. So, oh, you know, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, Edwin, uh, will you be open to PE or larger brewery acquisition? Is that a potential exit option? I know we've covered this a little bit in detail. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, I, I think you've pretty much covered everything on this topic but yeah feel free I'll, to I'll, I'll answer it again just because he mentions private equity and, and we've avoided that we've avoided any kind of sort of institutional investors um outside of the original five i suppose founders and two original investors no one owns more than two percent of black ops which means we've got a good structure for control of the business um we have full control of the business and we i don't want someone else to come in with an agenda to sell because i don't particularly want to sell i wouldn't i wouldn't describe it as a on principle, I don't have a problem with people selling their business. In fact, I sold my last business. Um, but it just I just don't think it's a good fit for a craft brewery that's that's like Black Ops. And um, so I wouldn't describe it as necessarily a principle, although it is, I do think independence is great. And um, it's important for people to be making things in Australia and companies to be owning it here and mm. shareholders to be residing here. I think all that is super important. But not to say we would never sell because like, but like I mentioned before, maybe one day we would. Yeah, definitely. All right, next question. Take another sip. Oh, yeah. Take another sip. What's the management structure beneath you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> beneath you, that sounds hit. a bit derogatory, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah we, we've had a proper management structure at Black Ops for about three years. The first three years, we didn't really have that. Um, so I'm the CEO. Uh, we have Eddie and Guz, the two other founders. Eddie's uh, the supply chain manager. Guz is the brewmaster. We have Ian, who looks after production and the production team. Ian Watson, who's, who's quite a well-known uh, brewer to people who are into the industry. Um, and then we have two guys that look after sales. We have, uh, and, and somebody looks after the tap room. Underneath there, we have another, other levels depending on where they are in the business. Um, so I, I'd describe it as a pretty traditional kind of a structure, which I, I actually like. I think it's important for people to have a clear line of reporting. And it's actually always a real challenge for us. And it still is to kind of find the correct reporting lines for people. So they know who their manager is and where they go for problems. Um, and being a small startup that's, you know, always understaffed, 
it's been really difficult to get that right. And in fact, in the first few years, we didn't even have that. It was just like, yeah, the founders and the rest of the company. Um, but we're all paid a wage. We're all, we all have employment contracts. We're all treated as much as possible like employees, which, which I think is the best way to go. We, we run like a serious business. Um, but the founders are always the founders. So, um, you know, pe people have, have a different, I guess, you know, thoughts about the founders as, as opposed to normal staff, which is normal, but we all have roles with position descriptions and remuneration commensurate with the roles. And I think that's, and, and a little bit of independence with a separate HR person. And so, and so I think that's important. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not, it's not a modern flat structure. I, I, I think hierarchies work reasonably well and, and it is, it is a, a proper org structure. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and Taylor here has asked, hello, how many shareholders does the company currently have? Yeah, so we've got 50 private shareholders, which is sort of like the traditional investment rounds. And we've got about 500 equity crowdfunding investors from the past round. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of responses to this EOI. I think we've had two and a half thousand. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but- Yeah, there's over um, two and a half thousand EOI responses yeah. so far. So I'd say, and I don't, I don't know exactly what the conversion rate is typically, but I'd say we're, we're going to get- you know, another thousand or I don't know, another 500, another thousand, who knows? Yeah. But yeah, we will have a lot, but um, we have pretty good systems for, for managing our shareholders. We've got a registry where the, the shareholders manage their shares. Um, I'm pretty good on my email communications. We do quarterly reports um, and we're pretty on top of that stuff. I'm not, I'm not worried that that's going to get out of hand. I actually like the idea of having lots of people who have a stake in the business. I've, I've always wanted that for Black Ops. So I'm, I'm quite excited to take on a lot more shareholders. Yeah, awesome. And uh, Jared here has just asked a question. I know we've covered this topic a lot, but it's clearly the, the favorite topic, topic of the day. Jared, so yeah. if the brewery sold, e.g. Bolter or Stone and Wood, um, would that small investor now get a return at all? I assume you're valuing your brewery yeah. at 65 million, for example. Let's say in five years you sell for 500 million. Would we feel some of that return growth as uh, an individual who owns shares in that business? Look, um, yeah. Uh, Dan, you can answer the rest of the question. Um, yeah, yes, course, yes, if yes. they did, yeah, then, yep. they, then the answer is yes. Um, yeah, yeah. You, 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 they, they would be buying, if they're valuing it at $500 million, they'd be buying a share at whatever that amount is, 35 bucks or whatever, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and you, yeah. I suppose you would you would sell that to them yeah, and, and get that return. Yeah, 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 correct. Yeah, but 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 like I said, like I, I, I to be honest, don't think the majors are going to buy another independent brewery for $500 million. Um, I think they've got enough and unless someone new comes into the space, I just can't really see that happening. It was also a bit of a, it was a bit of a one-off acquisition. Like if you look at Gage Roads, they're, they're about the size of stone and wood and they're listed on the ASX and at a value of 110 million. They're profitable. They've, they've got a massively well-known brand. Um, so I, I just, I just, I don't know. I don't know if there's going to mm -hmm. be another stone and wood. Um, yeah. But yes, if there was, or if we listed at that, at that valuation, which which you wouldn't, because there's not there's no brewery in Australia worth 500 million on the ASX. Um, right. That would be the same situation, but that would be better because you could choose whether to sell your shares. And um, you know, as a, as a small shareholder in a company, you, you really don't have control over that sort of stuff. If they sell, they sell, and, and you get the money back, but you're no longer an owner, and, and you might not want that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And Mark here has asked, are you looking to secure export markets for the product portfolio range? No, no time soon. We've, we've got we've got a lot of work to do in Australia, so so we've we've had opportunities to export, but the, mm. the the sort of proper craft beer doesn't export very well. We don't pasteurize our beer; it's not really well suited for exporting, so yep. it's not something we're looking at anytime soon. Yeah, awesome. And Daryl here has asked, um, yeah, do you have a board structure? What does it look like? Yeah, technically the board is me and Eddie. Um, we ha we have experimented with um, an advisory board, which we had for the last financial year. Um, we don't have it currently. I, I did find it useful, but it was sort of a vol voluntary thing. Um, the way the current constitution works is, and you can read it because it's up on the page when, when we launch tomorrow, um, mm. is your shareholding entitles you to board seats. And the way it is at the moment is that me and Eddie are the only ones entitled to a board seat and we're the only directors. Um, and I actually think that's working pretty well. I think if, if we were to... I think if we were to go down the path of listing, we would probably have to set up a proper board with some kind of industry people. Um, and, but I, I, don't, I don't really think it's something we need 
Um, I think the business runs very efficiently and, and me and Eddie work really well together. And, you know, like, like it's not just me and Eddie making decisions. It's, you know, me, Eddie and Govs are making the decisions and the management team meet every two weeks. And I feel like, I feel like we, we do pretty well on that front. We don't need a board that's more complicated than it currently is. But that may, that, that may change if I felt like it was important or if um, we go down the path of, of doing an IPO. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, and then Barry here, I, I know you've talked about the risks. Um, if there's anything else that Barry here has said, what do you see as the biggest risk to the business in the next three years? I know that you talked about this in a fair amount of detail. Um, if there's anything else to cover, now's the time. Yeah, g'day Barry, good to see you, mate. Thanks for coming on the call. Um, biggest risks, yeah, I think what I've said is, is probably the biggest risk, other than something you just haven't bloody thought of. Um, I would say the increased competition is significant now. Um, the decline in, in alcohol and um, you know, our, our business is, is it's pretty crafty in what we do. It's, it's not, not, not particularly mainstream where, you know, we're not doing, we're not doing the seltzers and the, the kind of easy drinking yeah. tins and stuff like that. So um, it is, it is a real crafty thing that we're doing. And I, and I think that, is becoming much more and more competitive, and I, I suppose that's our biggest risk. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything particularly outside of other than it's just you know it's a, it's a tough business to run. It's there's a lot of challenges that present themselves all the time, and I think I think that's a big reason why you see those acquisitions is like staying profitable, staying safe, keeping the team happy, keeping the founders happy, keeping the investors happy. It's incredibly difficult. And um, I think that's why you see a lot of these companies selling. So, you know, I, I try to focus on that stuff, not so much as a risk, but just as a good, a good thing to remember. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that's probably all I can give you on that one. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, anonymous attendee has said, do you cold chain your beer from production site to bottle shop to ensure the quality of the product is maintained? Yes, uh, so, so we do for independence. Um, all the beer at Black Ops is stored cold and um we all the indies as far as i know store their beer cold all the majors don't unless we do direct to store delivery um so we do send the beer to the dc which which we don't have any choice over it would be great if they kept it cold our interstate distributors keep the, keep the beer cold um but woolies and coals don't and it sits there in a, in a warehouse that's ambient temp and to be honest with you i, I you can tell like if, if you go to Woolies and BWS um, and you get a beer that's two months old, that's been sitting there in a warm shed, it doesn't taste as good as a beer from your local indie that was canned three weeks ago. Um, but that's just part, part of the challenge of growing a brand like this. It, um, it, it probably tastes better than the other products available in the shop, but it's better <laughs> yeah. the closer you are to the brewery and the quicker, um, you know, the closer to the brew date, the, the better the beer tastes. Of course. Um, yeah. Of course, of course. And Nathan here has asked, uh, has the canning line been holding you back? Is, um, of course, oh, I feel like it's cut off. <laughs> I need to just... No, I can, I can see it. It's, 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 it's close to yeah. 3 million litres yeah. possibility. Yeah, to 3 million litres, yeah. Possibly. Yeah, the, no, I would say that the canning line didn't really hold us back. We were able to get through that. We were doing two canning shifts. We were running seven days a week. Would have been easier to have a better canning line, but we didn't We didn't slow growth down, which I think is, is the crux of your question there. We. Yeah. I, I like growing organically. I like you know, taking the deals as they come on as opposed to chasing them. Um, I would say 3 million litres a possibility. The, the, the literage thing is, I mean, it's good from a point of view of keeping the business at the capacity of the tanks we have um, and utilising the equipment we have and the warehouse we have. But as a metric for how well the business is going, it's not one I'm particularly fond of because I think our, if you look at most, most breweries, like a lot of them are selling high volume, low margin, cheap product. And um, we don't do that really at all. Like, like, like our best selling beer is a 6% hazy IPA. Um, so volume, I don't think is necessarily the best metric to think of. And um, 3 million liters by the end of next year, for sure, that, that is definitely possible. I think if East Coast Haze goes mm. in the majors and growth continues on our other products, then definitely that is possible. But yeah. I don't think I'm going to be looking at that and thinking, yeah, we've made it, we've hit 3 million. It would be more like, you know, is the brand still relevant? Do people still love it? Is the product still good? And is the business profitable? And are we still growing generally as a company? Are the staff still happy? Are they safe? That's the kind of stuff I care about. Um, the, the leader leader is, is 
not such a big thing. But technically, we will be able to brew a lot more than that. We'll be able to pack a lot more than that. We've got six uh, 18,000 litre tanks coming, which means we can brew way more. Um, and we've got a massive cellar now that we're moving packaging out of there. So we could just get more tanks and um, we're going to do an upgrade to the brew house as well, which means we can we can brew more beers in a day. We could, we could potentially brew or do four brews in a day, um, which would be a big impact on the, on the amount of volume we can produce out of the place. So technically we can produce yeah. way more than we're currently producing, but it's, it's not, not my favorite metric to, to look at how well the business is going. Yeah, right. No, interesting. Really interesting. Um, somebody's here said, what sort of uh, say will investors have in the running such decision, decision making in the day to day or significant operation of the business, i.e. voting rights? So every shareholder um, is receiving ordinary shares. They do obtain a voting right with every individual share. Um, but in terms of the day to day running, um, this is not what the voting right is sort of like a part of the voting rights are corporate governance, um, which we can obviously send you a bit more information on. Um, it's a fairly sort of dry document to read if you want to read into corporate governance and how it's all managed. But ultimately, um, yeah, the day to day running is still, uh, yeah, the responsibility of the management team at Black Ops. Yeah, I would say, I would say, and, and again, it might not be the answer you want, but I'd say people who invest with a small amount of equity in a company like this don't have any actual control over the company. Yeah. Um, however, I think we're quite good with um, dealing with, with our investors. Like I'm, I actually really enjoy it. I know it's something with the companies are kind of fearful of with, with doing equity crowdfunding. Like they, they don't like the idea of, you know, getting phone calls from investors who are pissed off or, or whatever yeah, the case yeah. is. Yeah. I, I like that. I, I like the fact that we've got direct access to our investors and, and you know, if, if they've got ideas for things or, you know, if they're not happy about something, We've, we've done and I'm always available and open and keen to have those conversations. But when it comes to the actual control of the company, that's I, I, an investor who owns, uh, you know, a brief fraction of a percentage does not have control of the company. Um, yeah. And yeah, and, and, and shouldn't expect to have control, but you, you definitely will be heard and you definitely will have access to me. And, you know, and, and, and if you have issues, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about it and we'll definitely listen to, to whatever those things are. Yeah, awesome, awesome. <laughs> Just even <laughs> going through the chat, I love the comment here from Sam. I take a six month old Black Ops beer that's been in the sun rather than a VB that's been in a bright, from a bright, <laughs> from the bright. Don't keep beers in the sun if you're listening to this and thinking that that's a good idea. But yes, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, from another another anonymous comment, you mentioned only reaching uh, only if you reach your maximum subscription. But if you um, kickstart the distillery idea, what happens if you don't quite reach that amount? Um, look, these details are in the offer document; they are outlined there. Um, but Dan, I'm sure you can answer this in a bit more detail. Yeah, if, if we don't if we don't hit it, we we won't do the distillery this year. Yeah. Um, to be honest, we've had this distillery idea on our list of things to do for quite some time, and we're pretty keen to do it. So I would be very surprised if we don't do it at some point, but it would be really nice to get some extra funds through the crowdfunding to, to kick it off this year. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and then Nathan here has asked, Dan, hi Dan, seasonal beers seem to sell well on tap, EG Pale Ale and East Coast, and Hayes continue to be popular. Non-alcoholic growth seem, continues to leap. Any plans for a lower, um, like lower session ale bev, say 3%-ish hazy, um, to tap the market for something lighter and hazier than mid-range. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I think this is, I'm sure you've probably discussed this quite a lot, but uh, yeah, there's quite a lot hot, uh, I'm sure, which you're reading in detail around this question here. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, it, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm on the fence with non-alcoholic beers. I haven't tried that many of them. The ones I've tried, I didn't particularly like, um, but I can see it's a legitimate trend. Like I think there was three, was there two or three uh, non-alc beers in the hottest 100, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. We, no, to mm. answer questions, no, we do not have plans to do a non-alc beer. I suppose if, if it's a 3% hazy, potentially we could do that. We could yeah. sort of replace mid-range with a, with a you know, lower ABV hazy, but mid-range actually goes surprisingly well. Um, so we don't really have plans to do that. Um, it's something I will always look at. Like at first when it came up, it was like, oh, this is the most terrible idea ever. And as it, you know, okay, as you go on and these other bees get traction, you think maybe it's not the worst idea, but but we don't have plans to do one. 
and um, it would require more than what we currently have. Like we would require different equipment and we make all of our beer ourselves. A lot of these no, low out brands don't. Um, they sort of contract breweries and that's not something we're particularly keen on. Yeah. I like the fact that we make all of our beer. So uh, no time soon, I, I would say to that one. Yeah, awesome. Um, and there's another question here. What will be the total amount of shares issued, assuming full subscription for this raise, and how many of these shares are owned by the founders, staff versus public? I can answer this question because I've actually already got it up. So at the 2.2 mil um, max target, that would be just almost 3.3% in equity released in the business um, at a pre-money valuation of 65 million. Um, ultimately, the cap table, which is in the offer document, highlights exactly what the shareholdings within the company are, um, what they look like pre and post offer, and at a minimum and maximum subscription offering. Anything else to add on your side, Dan? I uh, Just the, the answer around the founders is, is we own about 50%. Yeah. Um, so the and, the, and the founders plus the original two investors, I think are maybe around 60%. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, and also, do you expect supply chain constraint and inflation to impact your margin? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I think we haven't seen a whole lot. Um, inflation is an interesting one. It seems to be a big problem in the US at the moment. And it, it, like you do sort of anecdotally see certain things going up. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, possibly. It's not, it's not something we're specifically planning for. Supply chain stuff hasn't really been a big problem. There was sort of some talk of there's, there's been small things like this, like pallet shortages, um, which we've been able to manage. There's, there was some talk of problems with cans during COVID, but that didn't seem to eventuate. I mean, if we couldn't get cans, we'd, we'd be in big trouble. Um, but so far, and we, we do hop contracts as well, like a year out. So we're pretty pretty onto that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a possibility for sure. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, and Craig says, thanks for the presentation so far. Um, I envisage that this will be included in the docs tomorrow, but wondering if the company owns any real estate it works from, or is this all leased? It's all leased. And I, and I actually haven't mentioned that in, in, in the actual offer documents. That's probably a good point. I probably could have mentioned that. We've got, um, we've got a really, really good landlord at BH2, which is our main production brewery, um, Bill Barry Cotter, who's, who's the founder of Riviera and Maritimo. And the sheds there were built for Riviera back in the 80s, and that was where they started. And they they love us, which is great. <laughs> and we've taken over the entire site there. Um, and so we're extremely happy with that arrangement. I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't see us looking into buying anything until maybe we outgrow that site, which is it's a long way into the future, I think. Yeah, right. And Wade has asked possibly my favorite question. So in terms of distribution, how broad across the country does Black Ops supply? Are there any plans to go broader? test new markets or will Black Ops be focusing on the current distribution region and building on the success? Yeah, well, we do, we do supply to all of Australia. We have distributors in Tasmania and WA. We've got Growler Depot over in WA and a, and a, a rep over there, Sam, who, who helps us out. We've got um, Polkadot in Tasmania. who do a really good job with our product and a, and a bunch of other products. Um, we've got Paramount in the other states they do a good job as well, but they have a, have a big, big uh, sort of list of products they sell. We also have shared rep through Paramount in New South Wales and Vic um, that gets out and, and showcases our, our product along with, I think, five other breweries um, or five other products. <laughs> um, and also Dan Murphy's and BWS. So, so we're national through, through those and we're looking to get more limes out through them and through Coles as well. We're always on those range reviews trying to get more products out through that. It would be good to have some direct distribution and direct sales in those territories, but it's very expensive and it's not something we're really going to look at unless we kind of get in back into a really comfortable position in terms of our staff wages and we can really confidently put some more staff on in those areas. Um, so our, our strategy has always been sell as much as we can locally and um, you know where we can sell into state and do it in a way that's not too risky and that probably won't change, but if, if, if our growth kind of dries up locally, we, we might look at expanding more into state and we're always looking to get more products in through those ex existing distributors. Great, fantastic. Another question uh, here, is there a plan to expand the taproom seating capacity? Oh, that'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> yeah. 
Brisbane and BH2 were pretty good. We, we had the hottest 100 parties in the weekend. I think we probably had over 100 people in each venue. Yeah. Those are those are really good. And and I don't think we need any more capacity. We've got outdoors at BH2 as well. Um, HQ is small and there's really no way to expand it. And um, so, so no, I don't think so. Um, if we were to do another tap room, I think we wouldn't do one as small as HQ, but it, you know, HQ has become a bit of an institution where it is. It is quite small, um, but it actually generally does pretty well. It's been a tough couple of months, but up until a couple of months ago, it was doing basically as well as the other tap rooms. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's a tough one. I wish we had better better support from council on on those kind of things. I mean, it seems crazy to me that they're trying to encourage people to go outside, but they won't let us have people drink beer in the car park which would be perfect. It makes no sense to me, but especially with COVID, you would think that that would be the first thing that would want people yeah. to do. That's what they're doing in other countries, but we don't have that luxury for whatever mm. reason. Um, so yeah, no specific plans of that. It would be nice, but if we do another one, I think we'd, we'd make sure we, yeah, we'd make sure we'd build one as big as BH2 yeah. or, or Brisbane. Yeah. Um, just to everybody, by the way, who's uh, dropping a message in the chat and saying, thank you. Great to have you along. Really appreciate that everybody um, might have a couple of things, might have things that they've got to go to. We will send everybody the recording afterwards. Um, and of course, everybody will uh, receive information who's on that expression of interest list as to exactly when the offer is opening tomorrow. So it is opening at 12 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and you will receive an email and text from us with that private investment link. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know the time that it's opening and uh, you'll receive all the information that you need to then i can't believe we still got 81 questions here look I, I, honestly for all the people who have asked these questions it's incredible i actually think that we're going to be able to whiz through some of these because i've seen quite a lot of them are really similar to some of the topics that we've covered already um so we're just going to do our very best to get through these um when we can jared here has asked other shares on offer equal weighting um to the founder's shares we've answered that one already um dan mentioned that there's 51 percent ownership between the founders um, and their shares, but everyone essentially has the, the same share class. Um, so we can move on to the next question. Alex here has asked, how has the $65 million valuation been derived? Uh, look, it's loosely based around Forex revenue, but um, valuation is another thing. I've got a big long article about it on the blog if you want to check that out. Um, it's it, The thing is with valuations, it, my, my approach to valuations is you don't really know what it's worth. Um, I'll, I'll link this article in the chat. It's called How to Value a Brewery. So this summarizes how I feel about the topic. Um, every time we do a raise, you kind of make up the valuation. And if you get a lot of people investing more than you want, then you know you've gone too low. And if you don't get enough, then you know you've gone too high. Yeah. Um, and you try to base that loosely around some kind of multiple so it has historical relevance. Um, and we've based it around a Forex, uh, loosely around a Forex revenue multiple, but a bit higher than that because I think, you know, you, you got to factor in things like the value of the brand, the growth of the business, um, you know, where you are in the market, all that kind of stuff, uh, and come up with something that you think is a good deal for current investors and new investors. And you never know if it's right. This one feels about right. I think based on what I've seen, um, mm. I haven't seen too many objections to the people have told about it. We've discussed it. I feel like this crowdfunding raise is going to go very well. Um, and if it does, it, it, it tells me that we've set the valuation about right. Um, but yeah, that's, you, you just don't know. And, 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 and hopefully, hopefully that answers your question, but you just don't know until you actually do the round. It seems about right to me. And, and, and I did look at you know, the market cap of some other breweries. I looked at recent sales and um, those we know about and like how much these kind of brands are worth. And I do think companies like this are quite valuable. So, you know, I've always valued our business and I always think it's, think it's worth, worth a decent valuation. Um, and hopefully that's reflected and hopefully it ends up being the right number. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then James Below has asked if there's, if there's any more hot swap coming. That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that until um, the Hottest 100 when it came in at, uh, number 60 or something i didn't expect yeah. it to come in so people obviously really like that beer actually that beer was originally supposed to be called boss swap and govs was going to go to new zealand and andrew from behemoth was going to come to australia and we were going to swap our brewers and each brew beer at the other person's brewery but because of oh, covid we couldn't so at last minute we changed it to hop swap and it ended up being 
our most popular limited release of the year by far. So Great. I think it would be stupid not to bring it back, but we actually don't have plans to brew it as a major limited release. So I would say good chance we'll do it as a small batch, but maybe we'll do it as a big batch as well. And maybe maybe with the new, well, New Zealand have got a different strategy with COVID, so we probably still can't actually go there. Um, but yeah, I'd say it will probably be back, but it's not in the list of beers to bring back. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, and Ryan here has asked, do you have any plans to how to, for how to increase distribution? Not specifically. I, I, I kind of believe in organic natural growth and I think the business and the brand is growing well. The, the, the biggest thing I would say is um, East Coast Haze. That's, I think that's going to be our, our biggest high growth product for the next 12 months. And we've got plenty of ability to sell more of that through our existing distribution channels yep. and by, by getting that into the majors. And that's, that's more, more what we're going to focus on. Yeah, awesome. And then somebody here has asked if there's any itch van available at the tap rooms, not crowdfunding related, but uh, yeah, they're very keen to know. Yes. Oh, I actually don't specifically know when that launched. I think it's it might be this weekend. I, sh I should know the answer to that question. It might be this weekend. Um, it's such a good beer. Yeah. Uh, there will be a little bit, but there's actually not much because we had that as a beer in HomeGuard, which is our subscription service. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to kind of make sure the beers that we do in HomeGuard are unique. And that was one of them. And there wasn't a huge amount left, um, yeah. but there is a little bit for the tap rooms, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the next question as well is really similar to another one um, that somebody else has asked below. Um, and look, I mean, like, what are your thoughts on a takeover if the offer is too good? Um, and somebody else has that as well has said, if a big brewery came along and offered to buy you, would you sell? How would this affect smaller investors? Uh, I think we covered a little bit already on kind of the fact that sometimes bigger investors come along, especially with crowdfunding investors, um, they might say, well, let me clear up your cap table and they buy out all of these earlier um, these earlier stage shareholders with such a small shareholding. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know that you've commented on this a little bit earlier, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've answered that one. I mean, if the offer is too good, I'm, personally, me, I'm not super motivated by the idea of selling for a lot of money. I don't know if the amount of money would change anything really. I mean, this business is already valued at more money than I would know what to do with. So it's not... That wouldn't, I don't think that would change anything unless, you know, the group of founders and investors just thought like, this is just too much. We, we should definitely sell. It's not, a, it's, it's not an option I particularly like, and I don't think the amount of money would necessarily sway it. But I mean, yeah. if they can buy stone and wood, they can probably buy anyone. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and John Brown has, he has said, how do you see advertising nationwide um, and getting more range of your beers into stores around the country? We've talked about distribution a lot. Being in Sydney, I find there is quite a limited range. <laughs> I think Matt was Matt was saying this earlier today. He's like, I just want more Black Ops beer in Melbourne. So yeah, yeah I think everybody's saying the same. Yeah, advertising actually is something we barely do at all. We 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 do well under one percent of our revenue on advertising compared to about twelve percent for the average business. I don't. I'm not a particular fan of it. I, I like the fact that, that we can build our audience and our growth through things like this and through our organic content. Um, that said, we have done it. We, we, we did it for East Coast Haze. So potentially some kind of launch around that and doing some advertising and some billboards and things around that in other states is a possibility. Um, uh. I prefer growing organically and, and word of mouth and it's grown, it's gone very, very well for us. Um, but yeah, more beer down south and, and around the country would be good. I, I think there's, there's definitely more work we can do. The, the deal we have with Paramount where they have a rep visiting sites is about to kick off and COVID is kind of screwed with all of that, but they'll have a rep going around to different venues that are only selling five different products. And one of them is black ops. So I think, I think that's going to have a decent impact. If it doesn't have a decent impact, then, you know, that hasn't worked as, as intended. Um, so I think, I think you can expect more, more black ops down south. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And I love Aaron's question here. Looking into the future, how do you see Black Ops looking? What size, what product offering? I'm asking for the crystal ball gaze here. Awesome. Yeah, Aaron's one of our uh, alpha team members from Newcastle. We've got Great. a crew down there. Um, Black Ops, yeah. I mean, I, I to be honest with you, I, I don't do much crystal ball gazing. I, I, I focus on the current problems. I think we're going to keep growing. I don't think the product offering will change a whole lot. I would like us to still keep a good relevant spot in all of these categories. You know, like I want... Like our hazy IPA was is, is one of the, the most well-loved beers in the country. I would love that to be the case. I'd love for East Coast Haze to be one of the kind of go-to session hazies. 
Um, I'd like Pale Ale and Hornet to be the, you know, the kind of flagship IPA in the Pale Ale. And I'd like us to be seen as a brewery that's creative and doing lots of different products. Um, and I'd like to be profitable and uh, growing at a reasonable margin. And, and that's, that, that's all. And the team to be happy and safe and uh, the founders to still love what they're doing. That's, that's more what I think about in terms of the future. Yeah, awesome. Great answer. Um, Warren here has asked, what's the um, staff gender split, front of house, but also brewers? Yeah, we actually have quite a few female brewers. I, I don't, I, I think we've got, we've got Dom, Chelsea, Ella. We've got at least three. I'm just trying to think. We, we, we do have a few brewers total, but I'd say we probably have more female brewers than almost anyone that's our size. Um, probably anyone that's our size, I would say. Um, but the actual percentage split, I don't exactly know what that is, but it's, um, yeah, brewers... Yeah, I don't know the exact percentage, but we've actually got quite a few. Um, tap rooms, tap rooms is quite a few guys. Yeah, I'd say tap rooms probably mostly women, but um, got quite a few guys in the tap room as well. Uh, a lot of women in the office. We've got um, me and HR Dan and the rest, rest women in the office. Um, yeah. And don't have enough women in sales. That's a, that's a big problem we've got. Is um, we we well, we're not growing the sales team at the moment, and, and we've got an absolute gun. Of current sales team members and we promoted historically through the company to get people into sales and we're still looking at doing that um but but we're not growing the team and we're definitely not getting rid of any of our current guys because they're all absolute legends but that's a real challenge for us <clears throat> next next few people we hire in sales definitely have to be women um also don't have many women um investors and i've actually i've actually got quite a few emails you know from this process from women, which is nice, because our historical sort of, um, you know, traditional top 50 investors are basically all men or, you know, I guess married couples where, where the guy has been the one to kind of reach out and be the most active. Um, so that, yeah, that's a challenge as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and an anonymous question here, the expansion plans note increasing beer production capacity. Are there any plans for more tap rooms here in Queensland or interstate with Pine Ridge? plans um is that local in the coast like able or looking to provide a black hop ex experience across other sites yeah well definitely pine ridge tap room that's something we, that we want to do yeah. um i'm always interested in looking at other opportunities for tap rooms but i'm just wary of the fact that you know you do anything far away from the brewery it takes your focus on what we're doing and we really want to be focused at bh2 at the moment and, and doing good quality beers there and expanding what we're currently doing um <clears throat> but i'm always looking at opportunities um and one like the Brisbane one, that wasn't something we planned. It just came up organically and it just seemed like such a good fit and it's gone so well for us. Um, you know, that kind of thing, if that pops up again, we would definitely consider it. But I'm not out there looking at sites around the country to build more tap rooms. Yeah, great. Fantastic. And um, somebody else here as well below, how do you rate the success of the Brisbane acquisition? Any plans for further um, expansion nationally? Enjoying my goat while I listen. Fantastic, Vaughn. Nice. Nice. Glad to Fantastic. hear it, Vaughn. I think it's been awesome. Brisbane, you know, um, we in, in 10 days, we turned that around from the current brewery to Black Ops Brisbane. The tap room from day one has performed almost as well as the other tap rooms. The crew up there are unbelievable. We've got a whole new team in the tap room up there when we took it over. Mick, um, who's only just recovered from COVID because half of the bloody team have had COVID in the last couple of weeks, um, does an awesome job on production up there. We're actually expanding a little bit, putting a bright tank in there and um, setting it up for a bit, you know, to in increase the quality a little bit to some extent, having the bright tank in there, making things a little bit easier. Um, it's gone. I, I think I'm super stoked with how that's gone. And, and if we had the opportunity to do something similar that's the kind of thing I'd be interested in because I think that's gone very well. Um, but that, that, that was, it was a real one-off opportunity. I think it, it, came, it came up very fortuitous and, and we jumped on it and, and I think it's gone very well. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And Lisa here has asked um, if there is any plans to expand the tap, Burley Tap Room. I know it's not part of this round, but um, yeah, understanding is that it, this is really strong demand for this. Yeah, I know that's a bit of a disappointing thing because a part of the idea with, with AWOL was, you know, HQ is so small it would be great to get more people in there. And we thought maybe having AWOL next door would have a bit of a flow on effect and people would sort of be like, oh, HQ is busy, I'll go to AWOL. Um, it didn't really work like that. I think people mm. just want the, to be assured that when they go somewhere, they'll get a seat. 
And through COVID, you know, we had lineups out the front of HQ and like even investors would kind of line up and the front couldn't get in and it's like, it was just shit. I mean, I mean to be honest, business was good. Our tap rooms were up considerably, even with the restrictions because they were constantly at capacity. But, yeah. you know, it's not, you don't want, you don't want your investors and your, your biggest fans lining up out the front. You want them to be able to come in and have a beer. Sure. Um, but unfortunately on that side, there's just not really any opportunity to expand there. Yeah. Um, so unless the council change their mind about drinking outside, um, there's, there's not many other options other than if we get more hours at AWOL, we can open that up as a nighttime venue. Um, but also I think there's a bit of charm to HQ. It's, it's become a bit of an institution there. And there's other options. People can go other places around, around the corner that have more room. And so it kind of is what it is. It is something I've thought about, but also people kind of love HQ as it is. And it's not the end of the world for it to stay small, I think. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Well, it couldn't be any clearer that car parks are a, a unique opportunity. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. If anyone from the council's <laughs> listening, give us an outdoor area. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Matt here has asked, any plans to distribute internationally, such as New Zealand? No, 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 no time soon. No time soon. Awesome. Um, and Joe here has asked, are there any plans to produce a non-alcoholic? We asked this one earlier, um, given the popularity. And there's another question below again about non-alcoholic. I really liked your answer um, around the opportunity that you're not looking at it, but obviously you can't discount uh, an opportunity when it's growing um, and when the demand is there. Yeah, I feel like I've answered that one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, what do you see as the main threat? Major retailers are either craft brewers, distillers. I think that you covered this in a fair amount of detail earlier um, around the bigger breweries being a lot more competitive than they used to be. Uh, but is there anything else that you want to add to this? I'm so sorry. I have, I think my internet has literally just dropped out. Uh, apologies. If... I've just lost, I've just lost your audio. Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Right. I've just, I can't hear you very well. Yeah. Hang on a minute. I can hear you just fine. And I, I just got a message from everybody else that they can hear. Dan is frozen. Yeah, can hear you did, both. You, did you just say my connection is unstable? I think we're coming back. I think we're coming back. Apologies, everybody. Um, oh, no. Oh, dear. I think so. Yep. Yeah. All right, I see a reset. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm seeing yeah, East Coast. I think it was the haze. Uh, clearly out in the sun with a VB. Peter, I love it. Yeah, he's probably using the time to go to the fridge, that's for sure. Uh, all right, am I back? All right, perfect, you're back. You're back. Uh, I think yeah. I, I live in... Where I live, I don't think it has enough internet to cater for everyone getting home at six o'clock. <laughs> yeah, it's how I felt when I moved over here. Um, so I can hear you perfectly now. Are you all good to go? Yes, I, hopefully this works better. Um, but yeah, so, so, the, so the, the major threat, I, yeah, I think, yeah. That, I don't know if major retailers are a major threat. I'd say the major brewery owners owning all of the good brands and, and consumers um no longer seemingly caring is is a pretty big threat so and and extra competition from other brewers and distillers is a big threat as well i'd say yeah yeah awesome um and somebody has asked a part of the question you've already answered but do you see zero and seltzers being a part of your lineup going forward in response to changing drinking demand yeah not really like we experimented with a seltzer um just for a bit of fun uh I think I've I've got fro frozen down again. Oh no! I'm I can hear you again now, Dan. If you want to restart oh, no. and try answering once more, I'll try. But it's going to be a bit of a shit experience for people if they can't um hear me properly. Amanda so, just said she can hear us both, so yeah. I'm hoping that everybody can hear us, and um, it's just happening to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah, no, I th no doubt that they're popular. I don't really think they're right for our brand. So I, I, for now, I'd say no to 
low alk and seltzers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, somebody here is, uh, as well has asked the question, is it possible the big company buys Black Ops, hence the share price upside? Um, we've asked answered I've so answered many questions question. on exits, um, so I think we'll move on. Um, two questions about the previous crowdfunding. Oh, Liam has asked it below. Um, what was the company valued at? And what was the share price offered? So we mentioned the share price, which is $1.18 in the first Yeah, and, round. and 18 million valuation. I think skip over some of these because some of these are from almost right. an hour ago and we've answered them. So yeah, if, I think I feel like if we've answered them, I think just skip them and we'll, we'll move on. Absolutely. Hi, Dan. Could you summarize the investor benefits? Yep, we've summarized those earlier. Um, perfect. Will you distill from scratch or import white spirit um, like Kalki Moon? Yeah, I imagine we'll, we'll do both. I know Govs is quite keen to distill from scratch and, and you would do that with something like whiskey, you, you'd be distilling the beer. Um, but it seems like with gin and other things, like to get a really clean product, most people import the spirit in. So ultimately that would be up to Govs. I know he's keen on distilling from scratch, but um, I, don't, I don't know if that's really what most people do. Um, we haven't delved into it too much. We've only done some smaller batch Mm. Um, things but if we thought we could make a better product by distilling it ourselves, we would probably do that um, yeah. if not we, we would get the spirit in i imagine yeah awesome awesome and steve here has asked a, a different question how much revenue do you foresee from the introduction of the distillery yeah i'd say not a whole lot i think you know as a tap room i, I think it could be quite a good and profitable tap room although our experience with awol has shown that these things are very hard to predict although with something like a gin and whiskey distillery and with the artisanal license I think we'll do quite well with that. I think it's a, it's a really good product that we know people want. Um, so profitability wise, I think it'll help us to have a distillery there. Revenue wise, I think it'll be pretty minimal. I, I don't I don't think it's going to be something we're going to be selling into Dan Murphy's and stuff like that. I think it'll be a real slow build, um, especially with the whiskey. It takes a very long time to even have a product, probably at least five years. Yeah. Um, so I think it'll be a small part of what we do, but it'll it'll be a good thing for us to kind of scratch that itch for ourselves, but also these things are good for staff you know like staff want new things to work on customers and investors want new things to be excited about we wouldn't do it if we didn't think we could make money doing it because it is a business but um there are other benefits as opposed to revenue growth i think revenue impact will be pretty minimal yeah yeah awesome um and then kurt here is after level is there high level organizational structure included in the offer document um yes there will be um in the yeah. offer document so I will just tick that one off. Yeah, if, I was just going to say, if you, want, if you want our whole org chart, just send me an email. Actually, actually, I totally forgot to put my details in here. The last slide, I had my details. I might just, can I share my screen again? Yeah, absolutely. But I'll, um, I will um, I'll follow up with everybody and share your details um, so they can access you or, or um, yeah, give you a call. Easy. Yeah, I'll, I'll, Very I'll, easy. Um, yeah, my details are up there. So I might um, chuck them in the chat or something as well. But yep. awesome. um, yeah, if you've got any questions, if you've got the whole little chart, I can send that through to you. But the one we can put in there is just the, the managers. Yeah, awesome. Dean, I uh, really hear your question and I, I hear you saying, please never sell out. I'm sure you've appreciated Dan's answers. So I'm just gonna tick that one off and move to the next. Um, will, the egg, will the distillery have a trial run for the first product like Eggnog Stout did for the brewery or if the max funding is hit, is it all systems go? Now nah, we'll just send it. Send it. I love it. Awesome. Um, ben Smith here. What's the current proportion of the ownership? Um, again, this will be in the offer document in a lot of detail, but um, yeah, I mean, look for any, any more detailed questions like this, please do feel free to shoot me an email uh, I'm on robin at virtual.com um, and I'll include my details afterwards. If anybody has any particular questions around the equity share percentage and they want to know how to work that out. Um, yeah, I've, I've listened, I should say too, I have mentioned the founders shareholding being at around 50%. But in the offer document, I list um, basically every investor that owns more than, I can't remember the exact percentage, 1% maybe. So there's about 40 investors listed on there. And then we've just got the crowdfunding investors and then the next round. But you know, we're, we're talking about small percentages overall um, yeah. that we're diluting. Yeah. So we'll go from, I think, founders, I think from something like 51 to 50% or something. Yeah. Um, and, and no one else outside the original five founders owns more than 2%. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, what are the rules around sophisticated investors? So under the crowdsource funding regime, um, which this is under, 
uh, sophisticated investors actually called wholesale investors. So these are investors who need to have had 250,000 in income in the last two financial years, or have assets that total more than $2.5 million in order to be able to invest more than $10,000. Now, those investors will need to supply an accountant, signed accountant certificate, um, basically certifying that this is true and correct from their accountant. But anybody who's submitted in that category or has shown interest above that will have received those details um, effectively to be able to include it. But if anybody is confused, please do send me a personal note um, and uh, yeah, I can, I can help anybody out with that. And uh, it's also included in the process as well. Um, ben, Dan, are you, are you related to Chuck Norris? I'm sure you receive that so frequently. No, well, no, I'm not. However, as I've gotten older, my beard gets a bit more red and I do wonder. But I, there was one day in high school when one of my friends came up to me and started swinging me around and said, let's Chuck Norris. Oh, awesome. And I've gotten over that. Everything's fine. It hasn't yeah. affected me at all. But either way, I'm sure you, uh, you push down on the earth rather than push up. Um, <laughs> so an anonymous attendee question for Robin what's the time period to, between tomorrow to leaving my account really good question so if you do invest in black ops tomorrow um, effectively I really want to highlight that every retail investor receives five calling off days after they make their investment um, so that's a, five, a calling off period that this crowdsource funding regime accounts for to effectively allow you to still consider your investment and a cancellation period but ultimately, um, for the investor and when you're making it, once the, once the actual campaign has passed its minimum target, um, payments do begin to gain, be collected. But we will reach out to you and send you an email before we, send, before we capture those funds from your account. So there will be a warning to say, look, we can see that you've left the details to um, make a direct debit payment and we'll notify you when we're going to take those funds out. So it could be, it could be a day, um, it could be three days, but we will let you know. That's the most important thing. Um, then Paul here has asked, in regards to exclusive events and brewing days, will there be ample notice for interstate, interstate investors? We definitely would not want to miss out on those. Also, on the we note, can you register as a couple investors or as a single names only? Um, I'm sure I'll, I'll hand over to Dan to ask the first part. Answer the first yeah, part. I, I will say also that I'm, I'm going through these and dismissing any questions that I've answered already. And so don't yeah, be great. offended if yours gets dismissed, but I just want to clean this up because I have answered a lot of these. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, we, we do give people plenty of notice for those Alpha Team days, and we do actually get investors fly up from interstate to attend those. So it's, it's really cool. If you're interstate, you get plenty of notice and, and you'll get the opportunity to come up, brew the beer, hang out in the tap room. And, and I always give people an in-person update and a tour of the latest happenings at the brewery as well on those days. Yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and then, yeah, in, in relation to investing as an individual or a couple, um, unfortunately, it is just restricted to single names only or a company. Um, then Craig here, what sort of reports and information on progress do investors get? Um, Dan, I know you can answer this in a bit more detail around what you do, but there is an annual report that is uh, sent out to every single investor, um, basically summarizing the financial year and also summarizing other key information that um, investors will receive on the company and its progress. Yeah, I do quarterly reports. So we do a, a report that reports on a whole bunch of different aspects of the business. I send it out from my email address um, to all investors. And then if anyone has any questions, I encourage them to reply. I will say though, I have, I did, when we did a survey at investors, I had a few that didn't get those emails because they went into spam or because they'd accidentally uns unsubscribed or something. Um, so if you do sign up and invest and you don't hear from me, it's not, it's probably not because I didn't send an update. It might be because it's gone into spam or something, but um, yes, I do do the quarterly reports. If anyone wants to see one, just send me an email and I'll send you guys an example of what those look like because they're not something we're required to do by legislation. They're just something that I like to do and they've got a unique format through them. Um, and I can send you the one, the most recent one we did at the end of 2021 if you guys want to see it. So you can just send me an email and I can send that to you. Yeah, awesome. Awesome, fantastic. Um, Craig, uh, in relation to your question, is the funding done on a first in, first serve basis or is there a time period? There is an open and closing period uh, date in the offer as outlined in the offer document. But if we hit the maximum target, that is a first come first serve basis. So um, yeah, it's once it's, once it's open, uh, 
it's 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 completely first come first in first first in best dressed effectively. Um, moving on to the next question, what percentage are you currently running at um, with all the expansion plans? Where is all the new business going to come from? From Kay, I think I've answered that one. You know, I, I think I think yeah, I, I think we've we've got we've got plans for continuing the organic growth that we already have. I think we're going to get some extra growth from East Coast Haze in particular. Um, and I've always been a fan of focusing on the product, mm -hmm. focusing on keeping a good business running and not chasing growth. Yeah. And if that fails us, yeah. we'll have a different strategy, but that's that's the way we do it. And I think that's good. And if, if that means that our growth drops off a little bit from where it currently is, that I think that can only be a good thing as long as we sort of keep up a reasonable amount of growth. And yeah, um, yeah, that's that's what we're planning. Absolutely. And then an anonymous question, what will the three original owners percentage ownership drop to if the round is if the max round uh, max amount is achieved? So effectively, look, it's um, like 3.3%. So ultimately, it would be just under 48% equity among the three founders. Um, so that's 3.3% for the whole. Correct. Yeah. So it's th and three we're about half of that. So it's, it's, ah, it's yes. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not, yeah. not just you guys being diluted. It would be everybody else. Um, yeah. It, go, it goes down to up. around 50%, I think. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. awesome. Awesome. Um, will there be opportunities to invest more after the initial investment, Anthony, if um, the round is still open, if the max allocation hasn't been met yet, and you can, can still invest more depending on your retail or wholesale investor status? The answer is yes, you can make a second investment. Um, That's until the maximum is hit. Is that, is that what correct? You're correct. Yeah. 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 Um, and if the question was more, are we going to do another round? Um, I would like not to do another one anytime soon. I would really like to hit our maximum on this one and you know have some money in the bank to to be comfortable for a while. So I, you know, I do encourage people if they think it's a good investment, then to invest now and not not wait around till next time. I do have quite a few people who've reached out excited about the fact that we're doing this again because they missed out last time yeah and last time it it, it it disappeared in six days it was only a small round um but this one's bigger i'm hoping everyone who wants to invest can invest this time mm. um because i don't i don't want to do it again any anytime soon um yeah but yeah yeah awesome um dan is there plans for black ops three on either the gold coast brisbane or sunshine coast please i think everybody just wants you to open a black ops where they are <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Black Ops 3 is, is pretty much Brisbane. I didn't call it that, but in hindsight, everyone calls it that anyway. So maybe I should have. Um, but on the, no, I don't think another Black Ops on the Gold Coast would make sense. Sunshine Coast, I mean, no, the, to answer your question, there's no plans for any of these things. Um, I don't think another site in Brisbane would make sense. Sunny Coast, maybe, but they've got a lot of good breweries up there already. Um, I, I think if we see an opportunity come up somewhere that makes sense, we would look at it, but we don't have specific plans. And I don't know if any of those locations would make sense. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Ethan, um, the recording will absolutely be available to watch back later. Um, yeah, appreciate your want to catch the start. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely send that over to everybody. Um, moving down through, Dan, do you have a feel for the number of investors from the first upcoming crowdfunding plan, uh, crowdfunding round who plan to invest in this upcoming round. Um, well, I mean, I, I, yeah. do you, if, if Aaron's still on the call, do you plan on reinvesting? I'd, I'd love to know. Um, <laughs> I know quite a few. I, I've had lots of calls from investors yeah. and people um, who I know are currently investing. Like looking at the people who are on this call and asking the questions, there's quite a few. I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to give you a percentage mm. and actually don't even know if, I suppose we will figure that out eventually, how many people reinvested. Um, but I suppose you, you you could argue that if they invested a small amount for the perks, you wouldn't reinvest. But I, I do think a lot of our investors are are um you know really happy with where we've gone over the last two and a bit years, and and will probably reinvest because they you know they they want to see us continue down that track. So I, I hope current investors will re, reinvest, and I've had a lot of interest from people if if any of the emails and phone calls and things are anything to go by. Um, but I, I don't awesome. know an exact number. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I just saw a message from Hilton. Missed out last time. Um, Trisha said we will be reinvesting. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, it's nice. great to see those messages. Great to see them. Um, uh, what is the total shares issued to date? Uh, also, total post this subscription round 
some finer details like that will be um, able to be worked out in the offer document. If anybody needs any help, I'm more than happy to help with this. But uh, I can't imagine that you know exactly uh, off the top of your head. If you did, it's can. 17 million something, 883, something like that. No, <laughs> incredible. So, I cannot believe you got that close. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I don't know the exact number, yeah. but it is in the offer document. And, awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, I suppose the number of shares is not not particularly relevant. It's kind of right. like, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the percentage of ownership and, and the price exactly. of the shares, but that doc, that stuff is in the doc. Exactly, exactly. Um, Stefan, any limits to how much we can invest per person? As I've explained for the wholesale investor requirements, um, these are the individuals who want to invest more than 10K. That does mean that anybody who doesn't fit within that um, essentially category is limited to investing just $10,000 per person. Um, so yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, any, any other questions around that, please feel free to message me personally. Um, Michael, I want to know how many beers Danny drinks a week. <laughs> I love that. Well, I, I like that you call me Danny. I haven't been called Danny since primary school. And back then I was drinking a lot of beers per week. Nah, I just kidding. Um, uh, uh, it depends. I mean, if I have, I have calls like this, I normally have a beer on them. Um, we do a bit of sensory at work, so it's kind of hard to avoid drinking. But you know, I'm 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 pretty skinny, so um, I can't drink can't drink too much. Otherwise, I wouldn't look like this. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, Brendan here has asked. I love the idea of a decent Queensland produced uh, whiskey. I'm not a rum drinker. Would love. Uh, would you have enough warehouse space to age the whiskey in barrels appropriately, or would you need to expand further? Yeah, we've got an absolute shitload of warehouse space. Actually, we had a we've got a really fun idea with the whiskey that we're probably not going to do because it's a little bit crazy even for us, but we wanted to build a cave and put the whiskey barrels in containers under the driveway. Um, I think for the amount of money we get through this crowdfunding, we're probably not going to have enough to be able to do that. But if we can somehow do that and do it safely, that would be super cool. Um, but as for warehouse space, we've got way more space there than we know what to do with. So plenty of space. The, the challenge with storing barrels in Queensland is the heat and the temperature. So we would have to think about that and, and whether or not we wanted to build some sort of a kind of a, you know, a, a sort of a um, insulated room or something to help with that. But um, the actual site where the distillery is, there's not a whole lot of storage in that sort of tap room area, but the entire BH2 site, we have more space than we know what to do with. So we've got plenty of room there. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um... Somebody else here, Brendan, I love the idea. Oh yeah, we've already answered that one. Peter here has said, why don't we see um, Black Ops more often on tap around the Gold Coast in Queensland? Is it the planned or is it a challenge? Um, I know you talked a lot about distribution earlier, um, but yeah, they said stone and wood is everywhere and I have to pick it by default quite often. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, stone and wood, you know, for the whole time we've been in business have been at least 10 times the size of us and they've been able to produce beer way cheaper than we do. Um, their, our beer is not as cheap as theirs, um, but that, that's, I, I wouldn't say that's the whole story. Um, you know, there's a lot of other breweries that sell beer very cheap. We're not one of them. So, so you would find some of those breweries on tap a little bit more so than us, even though they're, they're not necessarily much bigger than us. Um, but also I think, you know, a lot of these venues don't have room for 50 different craft beer taps. Stone and Wood managed, they just absolutely smashed it with, Pacific Ale and that you kind of went from a lot of these venues that weren't really craft venues having stone and wood on tap and uh, instead of Cooper's or as well as Cooper's and that became the default beer and it's 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 not not easy if, if you go into a venue that's got stone and wood and Bolter XPA on tap pretty, it's pretty hard to get into that venue unless you, you're going in with something different like a hazy IPA or an IPA in which case they don't move anywhere near as well and they cost the venue more money so yeah it is it is super tough um, but I would say our on-prem team have done a really good job. I think we are on lots of in lots of the right venues. Um, I would love to be in in more venues, but also don't really want to compromise on the quality of the product and the cost of the product. The point where we're no longer making money, so we're always trying to strike that balance. But that mm. I, I think hopefully that answers your question. I'd love to be in tap at every venue, but we can't we can't sell two hundred dollar kegs, and um, there's not a lot of room in these venues for multiple taps. Actually, another question in there that I saw somewhere was whether or not the, the selling of those businesses to the majors has helped us at all. And there is some possibility for that where some of these venues have stone and wood as their independent tap. Because a lot of these venues can only have 20% of the taps uh, available to them because they're contracted with CUB or Lion. 
Um, and in those cases, it's possible we will pick up some of these taps. I don't think that's really eventuated that much, although that sale only just went through. Um, but it is possible we pick up some of, more of those taps for that reason as well. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Carl, is there anything I can do prior to 12 p.m. Tuesday to ensure we get to be part of this offer and don't miss out? Um, look, unfortunately not, just sit tight, um, wait for our instructions and yeah, you will, you will be able to access the offer early as you've submitted an expression of interest and you are getting priority access um, if you're in that list. So yeah, um, the answer is no, unfortunately, you can't do anything more than you've already done right now. Uh, so Ben, are there any plastics band adapt your online offering as an example i buy your products from um Boozbud to take advantage of pre-delivery i would like to buy direct and find um you know and, and find your buy direct courier charges off putting is there a volume is it a volume thing even if it's spent x amount for free delivery etc cetera, etc cetera. very excited to get on board um and join the company though yeah it's a good question i, I think um like we could offer free delivery too but but the reality is the delivery is not free so um, yeah. you, you kind of you kind of absorbing that and losing all of the benefit of actually selling a product, or you're just charging what the delivery is, and as a result, people buy elsewhere. And the, the reality is, it is cheaper to walk down to your local BWS and buy Black Ops than it is to buy it from our website. And um, I, there are things that we want to do to expand our online options, but it, you know, if you look at that growth from seventeen thousand to two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars annually for our online part of the business. That's pretty staggering growth. And, and we've got a really good contingent of people who'd like to buy direct, especially with HomeGuard. We've got 380 people now signed up to HomeGuard. When we do the next intake in February, um, I'm hoping we can get to uh, get another 250 people in. And we do mm. try to incentivize people to come in um, and look at different ways to excite people. Like the comment there before about Ichiban, it's a beer that it's going to be difficult to get unless you're signed up to home guard so this way and and the beer we sell in home guard even the core range beer is under a week old so there's no no way you're getting beer from booze bud or any of our distributors under a week old so yeah. we are focused on the people who really want a direct relationship with the brewery and are happy to pay what it costs to get that and the reality is the cost of delivery is not free um sometimes we do do things like free delivery with a carton purchased but you know the delivery costs 10 or 15 bucks that's kind of all of our profit gone and yeah. unless you're kind of in growth mode where you don't care if you're making money, there's, there's a limit to how much you want to discount these things. And it's the same thing as the keg situation. We, we could get on more venues if we discounted the shit out of the beer, but mm. um, we wouldn't be a profitable business to do that. So it is always a balance. And, and I do hear you that, that you don't want to be paying delivery on cartons. And it's something that, that has come up before. Um, and it is something we will do occasionally with free delivery on, on boxes. We did that in December um, for, for East Coast. But that's that's how it works. It's awesome. we don't want to lose money, and 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 there are a contingent of people who would prefer to buy, you know, let's be honest, older beer through a distributor um, and get it cheaper than than buy direct and pay more. And th there's room for both, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Um, Chris here has said, congratulations on your growth. Sorry for being late. Is there intention to pay dividends if profits allow? I know you covered this in a fair amount of detail earlier. Um, around not looking to pay dividends out um, unless you're a very established company, of which at this point you're really just focused on growth. Yep. Good yeah. to see you, Chris. Thank you for coming on. Um, yes, I did answer this one earlier. So um, I think anyone who was late might just have to check out the recording. But yeah, no plans to do dividends as long as we're growing. Yeah. And um, you know, the, the return would be if we sell shares in the future at a higher price. Yeah. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. Tommy uh, has asked here, Black Ops Brisbane was a great expansion. Are there any other uh, takeovers? I've answered that. Later? G'day, Tommy. Yeah, Good to see you. Time. Awesome. <laughs> um, does, this, uh, does the opportunity for investment extend beyond the maximum 2.2 million during the second round of crowdfunding? The answer is no. So once that 2.2 million has been hit, um, essentially that is the round fully closed. And Sam, that really relates to a question which you've asked earlier around how long do we have to invest? Like if it opens... Tomorrow, when does it close? The closing date is listed in the offer document. Um, it's at some point in February. Um, but ultimately, once that two point, it, once the two point two million is hit, um, and look, I mean, uh, yeah, from the interest, I, I think that it will be hit. Um, but that's just what the data is saying right now. Um, that will also activate the campaign closing because once two point two million has been raised, we cannot continue to keep the round open. So. 
that's um, that's what you really want to pay attention to uh, when when looking to invest into the round. Yeah, I will, I will just add to that. I, I, you know, I don't want people to invest, you know, quickly without making the right decision. There, there is a cooling off period, which means you can Absolutely. change your mind. But I do want people to read the offer document and make a considered decision. I don't think it's going to sell out in the first day. Um, take the time to read the document, and I, and I hope you know I hope everyone gets a chance to invest. But I don't want people rushing in due to fear of missing out because it's not you know it is an investment and it's real money that you're talking about investing. So I do want people to consider it and invest if they think it's a good decision for them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Trisha, love your comment. You mentioned the stress of the adventure several times. Take care of yourself through the process. I love that. Thanks. Uh, with the with planned expansions, does this provide opportunity for more collabs and limited releases moving forward? Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, chair hop swap um, before. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine <laughs> there's a lot, lot that you want to do in the future. Yeah, collabs are actually we, collabs are actually a bit of a dirty word at Black Ops because they're just so there's just so much work, and we have a really lean team. Like we have we have one marketing person, you know, we've got one person looking after distribution. It's um, the sales guys are flat out like it's it's tough to organize a collab. We, we do them all the time, and we do have actually some pretty fun, interesting ones coming up. Um, but they have to be a really good fit because everyone wants to do a collab beer. But uh, it, they are a lot of work, and and you know a lot of people want to get in on our brand as well because it's become pretty well known and people like it and enjoy it. Um, so we, we need to make sure when we're doing a collab that we're getting some benefit from that as well. And I think the Behemoth one was good because they're a really really well respected brand over in New Zealand. Mm. So so we're keen to do more collabs with brands that are kind of offer what we offer, um, yeah. but not necessarily more in terms of the number of collabs. I want to turn my light on because I feel like I look like I'm in a dungeon. <laughs> All good. All good. Um, Hilton, your question uh, around the offer document getting sent out tomorrow, it will be available basically online as soon as we send out a notification that the campaign is open. So you can go onto the company profile page um, for Black Ops and go and check it out and uh, download the offer document. Please do have a good read through it, read the risk section, read the strategy and understand the business um, before going ahead and investing. I love that somebody's asking you here, is that the same beer you're drinking? I think you just, you have to answer it, Dan. I do, no, it's not. I bought two and I've got oh. a Yeti, which awesome. is a, uh, have you seen these? These are really cool. They're like an insulated cooler. Nice. So I knew this meeting was going to go forever and I didn't want to run out of beer, so I've got, I bought two, and this one's just finished. So I've timed it pretty well, I think. I'm so poorly prepared. I'm so poorly prepared. I didn't even have a Black Ops beer. Um, so next time, I'll know. I'll know. Um, any chance of the dark brew becoming more regular than limited release? Well, eggnog we brew all year round. It's always available at the tap rooms. Yeah. Um, we're also probably going to do a black a black uh, blackout tap blackout at the tap rooms yeah. this year again, where we where we do sort of like ten different dark beers. Mm. Um, we will try to sell some of those online, but in terms of in the core range, no, there's just they just don't sell, and we've got a big enough core range already. Um, we did do we did a Black Hawk Stout and Mega Hornet as a mixed limited release, which went pretty well in 2020. Um, but it's just with limited releases, like the hazy IPAs sell so well and everything else, everything dark just doesn't sell, yeah. which is disappointing to us. And like when we do a limited release, like the Afterburner, we're doing it because we want to do it. Like we know it's not going to sell as well as some of these hazy IPAs, but we don't want to just do a different hazy IPA every yeah. week. So um, yeah, we love dark beers, but <laughs> unfortunately they don't yeah. sell in high volumes. Yeah. I just literally seen it come through online, please. I live in Northern Territory and it's the only option. Yeah. I can yeah. just, yeah. Everybody we'll try and put some more beer. dark ones online for sure. Yeah. it's a, When it's we do the tap blackout, we'll have a bunch of darker beers. So we'll, we'll make sure we put some online. Awesome. Awesome. Um, would you look at doing a separate crowdfunding for Pine Rivers down the line? Amanda's asking. Uh, Pine Ridge, not Pine Rivers. Pine. But ah. uh, no, I don't think so. I think we can get it done on this one. And um, I, I mean, I suppose if it turned into its own business where we wanted to, you know, up the distribution or the manufacturing or something, I suppose you could you could yeah. see the potential in doing another crowdfunding, but I don't think so. I think this one, we can do this one, we can kick it off and then we can see how it goes. 
Yeah, awesome, awesome. And uh, the last two questions are similar. Um, do you have any plans to use the digital technology, blockchain, NFTs, token distribution? Dan can ask if you're joining the NFT space shortly. Um, is this something you are just doing for a bit of fun, or will you look at, um, yeah, maybe adding into your investment offers? Yes, we do. We've got two projects in this space. We've got our own Discord, which you can join. So if you go, just Google Black Ops Beta Team, you can find access to that. Um, the one thing we're working on at the moment is a, a, a Hopman kind of profile picture NFT project, which uses our Hopman character from the Moon Dancer beer that we did, and everyone gets like a unique little Hopman. Um, to answer your question, is it just a bit of fun? Yeah, pretty much. I think I, I don't. I don't know if it's going to turn into a really significant thing. Although the community on Discord is pretty good, we've got about maybe three fifty, four hundred people in there. It's pretty reasonably active. It's starting to get going. Um, everyone's pretty keen on what we're doing there. I like it for a bunch of different reasons. Um, so yeah, I want to do more with that. And if you want to contribute to that, you don't have to invest. You can just Google the Black Ops Beta team um, and just join that Discord and join in that conversation. It's pretty new and I'm, I'm open to all ideas in there. Cool. That's great. Oh, I can't believe it. Everyone, we got through 126 questions. <laughs> 127, oh, nice. thank sorry. You, thank you everyone yeah. for staying on here. There's still 100 people on this call, so I, I that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that we've been able to just, yeah, spend this time. Um, Discord address, yeah, you've just added I'll just it put it in the thread there, so <laughs> blackups.com.au forward slash Peter. Yeah. Um, look, as I said at the beginning, I think uh, the fact that we've been able to work together and kind of work on, yeah, the Black Ops equity crowdfunding round two uh it has been an awesome you know journey to to really see you just on this growth because obviously since the last round you've done so much as a business and i absolutely love your motto of really just under promising and and really just going getting down to work and and really just focusing on the business and its immediate problems and and applying immediate solutions to it because it's worked for you and uh yeah clearly you've just got such an interesting path ahead but uh, yeah, thanks everybody for, for tuning in and staying so much longer than we'd originally planned for. No, so uh, yeah, next time I'll chill a beer and, and make sure that it's ready to go. Clearly underprepared. But uh, I, I planned ahead. I, I knew I knew this was going to happen. I know happen. you did. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Welcome. everyone. And um, yeah, if you do decide to invest, then I'm super keen for that, and I'm available to you if you have any questions. Yeah. And um, yeah, I appreciate all the really good questions. It was great. Yeah, it was it was great. Everyone have a great time. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any further questions. So yeah, it was uh, yeah really enjoyable. And take care, everyone. See ya. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.